apologize for the delay. We are still having video problems. Uh, so what I'd like to do is we need audio for this meeting to actually be taking place because the state requires that we have that. So I will do a quick test. We have the computer at the desk working so we can see people. We are recording this, so if anybody wants to watch it later, they will have the actual recording. But uh, for that, for I will call on Council Member Cisneros. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Okay. Council Member Knox, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. So it is now, since the clock isn't working, it is 151 on and happy Tuesday to everyone. 2 22 22. So happy Tuesday. So it is 151 on this Tuesday, February 2nd, 22nd, 2022. I am Mayor Pro Tem Dave Martin on behalf of Mayor Turner. Mayor Turner is attending the 25th annual Barbara Jordan National Forum at the LBJ public affairs school at the University of Texas. So he will not be joining us today. He will come back tonight. I'm calling this meeting of the Houston City Council to order as a hybrid meeting with some council members joining in person and some using Microsoft team. We have four proclamation presentations today. The chair now recognizes council member Michael Kubash for the presentation to Rashawn McDonald Recognize his outstanding contribution to television, film, and radio. So, Council Member Kubash. Is it on? It should be on. Wow, what a day. Uh, two, 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 two. And you're here with me. Thank you. Uh, it's good to be here with Rashawn McDonald, Houston native. Rashawn McDonald is an Emmy award-winning and NAACP image award-winning executive director. McDonald was born in the 5th Ward District of Houston and as an adult changed the local entertainment scene with the famous Hip Hop Comedy Shop Stop Comedy Club. The comedy club launched his career as an actor, stand-up comedian, and sitcom writer. He became the branch architect of Steve Harvey's multimedia entertainment career, two-time award-winning and three-time NAACP award-winning executive television and film producer, social media influencer, motivational speaker, and award-winning baker. Roshan is the executive Baker, got to get that out there. Yeah, I got to get that baker in there. <laughs> I, I was hoping you was going to That was the most important cake. part you said was the baking part. <laughs> okay. Rashawn is an executive producer for the ESPN Plus hit show, Steve Stevens A's World, hosted by Stephen A. Smith and serves as his business manager. He is a creator and host of the number one syndicated weekend show on Black Radio, Money Making Conversations Masterclass. The Masterclass shares advice on success and features interviews with successful celebrities and entrepreneurs. Rashawn McDonald has also made outstanding contributions to the military recruitment for the Air National Guard. He has worked extensively in television, film, and radio production, with, which ha has included top uh, shows like Family Feud, uh, Steve Harvey Talk Show, James, Jamie Foxx Show, Sister, Sister, uh, the Parkers, the Hollywood blockbusters, think like a man and, and think like a man too. He also has created marketing plans for three consecutive number one New York Times bestsellers. Rashawn graduated from the University of Houston with a degree in mathematics, and he is a member of the Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. <laughs> He has, he his wife. I'm sorry. 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 They barking it open right in the middle of your speech. I feel like I'm with Steve Harvey. <laughs> he and his wife Cecilia continue continue to give back to the community about pro pro providing college scholarships, supporting uh, uh, optometry and stem cell research for. 
his outstanding contributions to television, film, and radio production, as, as well as extensive accomplishments in other areas of entertainment and information. Mayor. So therefore I, Mayor Pro Tem Dave Martin, on behalf of Sylvester Turner, Mayor of the City of Houston, hereby proclaim February 22nd, 2022 as Rashawn McDonald Day. Thank you. Wimbledon moment. Wimbledon moment. Okay, cool. How do you do that? What were you doing? Uh, <laughs> I can't do that. They make fun of me when I do this, so I can't do that either. No, no, no. She, 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 she do you wrong. <laughs> Mr. McDonald, would you like to have a few words? Family and friends. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up, everybody. Hold We're shot. Up. We're shot. Okay. It's your time to. What? What? Would you like to have a few words? I love I love to share a few words. Right. Um, first of all, I am from um, Fifth Ward, Texas. Grew up in a family, a uh, shotgun house. If you don't know what a shotgun house is, uh, open the front door, shoot a shotgun, and bullets go out the back door, you're in the right house. Six sisters, two brothers. My um, father had a third grade education, truck driver. I wasn't supposed to be here, but people saw something in me that I didn't see myself. When I graduated from high school, I got a job as a forklift driver. I thought that's what I should be in life. Those are my mentors. That's what, it, that's what inspired me. But more people saw more in me. But today, I just want to say that my family's here, and I got to correct my wife's name, because when we got married, somebody said uh, Cecilia. It's really Sicily, and I didn't correct it. And I've been living that down for all the, since 88 years. <laughs> so if I let you, councilman, say it wrong, I got to live it down for another 88 years. Okay. But again, I just want to say this. It's about giving back. I want to make this announcement to everybody. On April 2nd, I'm doing an event on Texas Southern University campus. I read an article uh, in the Washington Post February 11th. It said in 2019 to 2021, the enrollment had dropped 17%. And so around this country, I've been going around doing HBCU events. I did it at Alabama State, Montgomery, Clark Atlanta, Atlanta. I did it in um, Winston-Salem in North Carolina. Now I'm doing it in Houston. And I, and, I, and I bring this forth to you guys saying I want support because it's about what I do is I bring students in free, I bring their parents in, and I get at least 13 other HBCU campuses on the campus of Texas Southern University. It's on a Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. If a student brings their transcript and their test scores, they can enroll on the spot. And if they nice. qualify, they can get scholarships on the spot. And uh, I've been doing this since I was 18. And to be able to, on my day, to sit in, the, in this great city, which I call home still today. I live in Atlanta. I have a home here. My daughter's graduating from the University of oh, Houston this semester, a school that I said I was going to graduate in four. It took me seven. So I was like, intellect doesn't like fly too fast in my house, but it does say I have a degree. But if y'all could support me in my goal to change lives, on this day, that's April 2nd, it's called HBCU College Day Career, and Ex Career Fair Expo. And my job is to get corporations to come in there on the campus. And that's the whole goal. We're not in the venue off campus. We're on the actual campus of Texas Southern University. And that's the difference maker. Because I'm trying to kill stereotypes. I'm trying to let everybody know that back excellence exists. Let me just give you some facts and I'm going to shut this down. 80% of the judges that are black come from HBCUs. 70% of the dentists and doctors who are black come from HBCU. 18% of the CEOs in this country who are black come from HBCUs. 25% of the STEM graduates who are black come from HBCUs. 50% of the public school teachers in this country who are black come from HBCUs. 40% of the members of Congress who are black come from HBCUs. That is black excellence. But what gets always promoted by HBCUs are the bands, the athletics. I'm about the black excellence, and I'm telling you, if you help me out, I want to make this an annual thing, but I, but this is supposed to be my day, but it ain't my day. It's by people that can change lives. And April 2nd, I want to change lives. If y'all can help me out, that's all I got to say. We do, have a, we do have a council member that would like to address you. Uh, council member Pollard. Mm -hmm. 
I just want to congratulate you on all your success. Uh, many of us grew up on many of the shows and, <laughs> and productions that you put on. Uh, but as a Morehouse College graduate, I want to thank you for your advocacy of HBCUs. And I request that if you could please have your office send the council members the information on April 2nd so that we can get it out to our constituents. And thank you for all that you do. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. All right. Council Member Thomas. Thank you, Vice Mayor Pro Tem. Congratulations to you, your wife, your family, and everyone that's here supporting. As my colleague mentioned, um, grew up on Sister Sister. I just started streaming <laughs> that uh, this past weekend. Um, so just congratulations. And as a proud Prairie View graduate, I just applaud your work uh, with HBCUs um, and, and expanding the narrative, which is so important, which really aligns to some of our city initiatives around our summer job program and, and yes. all of those things. So it'd be a wonderful collaboration. Um, and it must be Omega Day. I see a bunch of cues and just, just all <laughs> Absolutely. around. I mean, it is <laughs> I mean, but I love it, though. You got to love it. Um, so congratulations to you. If I can or my office can ever support, please allow us the opportunity to do so. Well, thank you. The, the whole goal is that um, it's a narrative that we all have to change, a stereotype that we all have to change. And one of the changes all it comes about when people hear the story. You know, McKinsey Scott made headlines in 2020 when she gave over four billion dollars in donations to HBCUs. Well, that's a, that's, that's a stopgap. I'm trying to create long-term impact. I'm trying to take young kids who may not pursue a higher education to turn them to taxpayers, turn them to citizens who want to, want to make a difference in this country. And it's only done through being in this forum to be able to talk to you guys. I may not have gotten this without this honor. And so I thank you again for taking the time to say I deserve this. All I can say is that as I stand here with my friends, my family, and I consider you a friend, and I consider you guys my peers, is that God has been good to me. He's yes. enabled me to change people's outlook and my ability to tell jokes, to write sitcoms, to manage amazing talent. But my gift from now on is to change young people's lives. Very and nice. that's what HBCU College Day and Career Fair Expo April 2nd on the campus of Texas Southern will do. Thank you very much. All right, if y'all can go ahead and come inside the a horseshoe for the quick picture. Are y'all coming in for the picture? Okay, come on in for the picture. Can he open that? He can't help him. Thomas, we can't get her on yet. Next, the chair will recognize Council Member Thomas for a presentation to Nicholas Perkins to recognize him becoming the first African American to own a national burger franchise in 2021. Good to see you. Council Member Thomas. You need to meet Ricky. Attorney. 
Are we on? Thank you, Vice Mayor Pro Tem. I am excited. There's so much energy in the um, in the chambers, and I hope the guests that uh, celebrated with the previous proclamation will stay um, to receive our second um, uh, recipient today. Uh, so. As we conclude Black History Month, and this week I have the honor and privilege of introducing to you two, Mr. Nicholas Perkins. Mr. Nicholas Perkins, um, this is a wonderful opportunity, not just for our city and for his work, um, but really for the future when we talk about our economy and where his personal and professional principles aligns with our city strategic initiatives. So the Houston area is wonderfully enriched by dedicated individuals whose compassion and selflessness has improved the quality of life for so many people. Mr. Perkins has contributed greatly to the many worthwhile causes. He's championed for change and continues to be a pillar in our community in several communities throughout the U.S. Mr. Perkins, in a precedent-making business deal, acquired the Fuddruckers franchise after already owning 14 Fuddrucker eateries in 2021. His efforts to revitalize Fuddruckers has led him to create new offices for restaurant headquarters, keeping the scores of white-collar jobs in Houston and maintaining the city as Fuddruckers Hub, which has nearly 100 locations in the United States, Mexico, Can Canada, and Panama. Along with Fuddruckers, Mr. Perkins owns Perkins Management Services, a company that provides contract meals to historically black colleges and universities and government agencies. Clearly a theme going on today with HBCUs. Uh, he also is a board member of the Boys and Girls Club of Greater Houston, the National Urban League, once an urban leaguer, always urban leaguer, created Black Titan franchise systems to serve as the operating company for the Fuddruckers franchise and has donated millions of dollars to help educate students at HBCUs. On February 22 of 2022, Mr. Perkins will be recognized for his tireless contributions to our community in recognition and appreciation of his dedication and loyal of service. The city of Houston commends Mr. Perkins for his great compassion and kindness to so many people and worthwhile endeavors over the years as a true individual of service. Mayor Pro Tem. So therefore I, Mayor Pro Tem Dave Martin, on behalf of Sylvester Turner, Mayor of the City of Houston, hereby proclaim February 22nd, 2022 as Nicholas M. Perkins Day. Congratulations. <laughs> Mr. Perkins, if you'd like to have a few moments of time to say something profound, I feel like you're going to say something <laughs> profound. I would. Thank you all very much. I, I first have to uh, say thank you, uh, Councilwoman Thomas, for your recognition of me, uh, the work that I have been able to do. But none of that would be possible without the dedicated team members that I have here with me uh, from uh, Fud Rutgers and, and Perkins Management alike. I must also say that the city of Houston has been so very kind to me uh, since my arrival here seven months ago, uh, post acquisition of Fud Ruckers. It has been a, 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 a somewhat of a tumultuous ride with the acquisition and stabilization of the company, but the city uh, has been tremendous. And I want to thank you all for all that you have done to welcome me, uh, to support us through our acquisition. And the and this being the largest city that I have, have ever been a part of, I must say uh, the tremendous work that you all are doing uh, to run such a, ma a major uh, city. And I just want to thank you all for being so kind to us. Keep us in your prayers and keep us uplifted as we go forward to do this work. On behalf of all of us at, at Fuddruckers, Black Titan, and Perkins Management, I'd like to thank you all again today for this recognition. Mr. Perkins, before you leave, we do have a, a council member in queue. Council member Alcom. Thank you, council member Thomas, and thanks for being here. Uh, we love Fuddruckers in my house. I have four kids, and we went, that was our go-to place after every soccer game, every baseball game. So thank you. Love the burgers, and, and hope to see you do really well here in Houston. Mr. Perkins, I'm going to ask, um, we had a Fuddruckers in District K that closed down. Um, we are looking for opportunities for Fuddruckers to return to District K. So let's let's talk about that kind of economic development that okay. can happen in our community. So right. I'm happy to see you here. Yes. And I love Boys and Girls Clubs. Um, when I moved back to Houston, my son attended the Boys and Girls Club. We have a long history of Boys and Girls Club for families to have a safe place for their kids to go for $5 a year. It is a 
a tremendous need in our community. So thanks for your service there. But let's um, get your number. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Y'all ready for your photo? Did you want to invite your family to come up and your team to come up for a photo? Next, the chair recognizes council member Cisneros for a presentation to Bark Veterinarians to recognize three veterinarians for their amazing work. Council member Cisneros is attending virtually. Uh, th thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Pro Tem. I would like to ask Dr. Sherry Wittenberg, Dr. Aaron O'Toole, and Dr. Grace Lee to come to the podium, please. So while they're coming up, um, I wanted to say that today is World Spay Day. World Spay Day is an annual campaign to encourage people to save animal lives by spaying and neutering companion animals and feral cats. It's celebrated annually on the fourth Tuesday in February, which is today, February 22nd, 2022, and is part of Spay Neuter Awareness Month, otherwise known here in Houston as Love Your Pet Month. So um, why spay neuter, you may ask? Spay neutered pets reduce animal overpopulation. Spay neutered pets are less likely to wander or be aggressive. Spay neutered pets are healthier, happier, and have longer lives. And there are, are plenty of no cost or zero cost of spay neuter opportunities in our city. Um, we are nearing the end of Love Your Pet Month, and it is most appropriate to recognize, honor, and appreciate these three special people, these three veterinarians who serve the city of Houston um, in, as, as veterinarians. Um, so I'll read the proclamation. Um, uh, whereas Dr. Sherry Wittenberg, Dr. Aaron O'Toole, and Dr. Grace Lee have tirelessly worked to improve the quality of life for all animals under the care of BARC, the city of Houston's Animal Shelter and Adoption Center, and whereas Drs. Wittenberg, O'Toole, and Lee have been instrumental in promoting the importance of spay and neuter of pets to reduce the overpopulation of homeless animals, promoting process improvements within the medical division of BARC and promoting responsible pet ownership within the city of Houston. And whereas Drs. Wittenberg, O'Toole, and Lee have distinguished themselves as dedicated public servants at all times committed to providing medical care to the more than 500 dogs and cats in BARC's care each day and over 25,000 animals in BARC's care per year, and whereas their colleagues know each of these veterinarians to be dependable, action-oriented, and supportive co-workers and friends who take great pride in their work and the animals and communities they serve. Mayor Pro Tem. Therefore, I, Mayor Pro Tem Dave Martin, on behalf of Sylvester Turner, Mayor of the City of Houston, here do hereby express my sincere appreciation and gratitude to Dr. Sherry Wittenberg and Dr. Aaron O'Toole and commit to our city and proclaim February 22nd, 2020, 2022 <laughs> as Dr. Sherry Wittenberg Day and Dr. Aaron O'Toole Day. Would either of you like to have a few words? Well, we're not much on public speaking, we're veterinarians, <laughs> but we do appreciate everything your city council support, the mayor support. 
uh, for all the improvements that have happened over Bark. We've both been there collectively for about 12 to 13 years now. And it's just been amazing the transition that Bark has made and the ability to provide care for the community and animals in our, in our care. It's just amazing and we thank you very much. And, and to all our staff at BART too. We couldn't do what we do without the vet techs and the animal care technicians and the animal control officers. So thank you. Well, thank you both for being here. We appreciate all the work that you do at Bark. Our communities appreciate the work that you do. We know this is challenging work. Um, and for us to be able to partner with each of you and continue to do this great work for our uh, pet families, uh, we appreciate everything that you've done. Uh, did you want to have any words? You look I, like you were headed towards the microphone. I, I just wanted to say thank you very much. And it's an honor to work at Bark, And it's an honor to work with all the people that we do at Bark. Yes. Well, we're very happy to hear your comments about the improvements happening yes, at Bark. Absolutely. We've been working very diligently to make sure it is the best for our citizens in Houston. So thank you again. We couldn't Congratulations. Your support. Thank yeah. you. Congratulations. Turner here. Yes. All right. Do you have it? Renee, do we have the proclamation? Y'all got to be kidding me. All right. There was a presentation scheduled for Dr. Cynthia Turner to honor her retirement after 33 years of service to the Houston Health Department Laboratory. And there seems to be a slight problem with um, having the proc. However, that's not it. All right, we're going to, we, no, we will definitely make the best of this. I will tell you, um, Dr. Dr. Turner, I know that they, they communicated directly with the mayor's office and he's out today. So we're, um, I apologize profusely that we don't have the pro have look the, at the have, proclamation have, that just yeah. happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can you make it big? You want, I'll read it. I'll read it. I'll make it a little bigger for me here. That's good. Good. All right. Okay. Oh. Okay. And the proclamation reads, Cynthia Davis Turner was hired as a microbiologist by the Houston Health Department on March 6, 1989. She worked alongside colleagues during Tropical Storm Alicia and performed tests using portable generators for well over a month due to the lab's flooding. Her interest in ensuring that the lab had a uniform training strategy led to the informal position of laboratory training coordinator as conferred upon her under the leadership of Dr. O'Neill. Nisha Bishop. She developed a novel program called the Clinical Laboratory Sciences Mentorship Program in 2012 via a discretionary funding award from the Texas Department of State Health and Services. She partnered with the Biology Department of Texas Southern University and over the years mentored and or employed over 30 students through Excuse the program. Me, Dr. Turner also served as program <laughs> facilitator in the Houston Health Department intern training experience for third year students enrolled at Baylor College of Medicine's longitudinal ambulatory care experience. As laboratory supervisor, she oversaw operations for three separate lab subsections and the laboratory mobile unit. In 2006, she was heavily involved in the coordinating 
coordinating of rabies testing when a local teenager passed from infection. In 2009, she successfully facilitated the development of a fully functioning mobile laboratory to address a syphilis outbreak in the greater Houston area. The mobile unit lab operations played a pivotal role in a massive community outreach project sponsored by the Houston Health Department entitled Hip Hop for HIV. Additionally, during the 2009 H1N1 novel influenza outbreak, Dr. Turner coordinated the training and accessioning of over 7,000 specimens that were successfully tested and reported in response to that public health event. After more than 32 years of service, <laughs> Cynthia Davis Turner has chosen to begin her well-earned retirement on February 28, 2022. The city of Houston is grateful for the immeasurable contributions made by such a dependable and talented employee and extends best wishes to Cynthia Davis Turner for a long and happy retirement. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, thank you. Therefore, I, Mayor Pro Tem Dave Martin, on behalf of Mayor Sylvester Turner, do hereby proclaim today, February 22nd, 2022, as Dr. Cynthia Davis, Davis Turner. Turner Day in the city of Houston, Texas. Congratulations. Woo! Dr. Turner, we do have a council member in queue that would like to address you, and then we want to hear from you today. Okay. Uh, council member Pollard. Thank you, Vice Mayor Pro Tem, uh, for that. And just congratulations, Dr. Thank Turner. You. That is an extremely impressive resume. <laughs> I want to thank you for your over 32 years of service to the city of Houston. Uh, just hearing the things that you were able to accomplish made a real impact and a true contribution uh, to many here. And so for all of us here at council, I just want to say thank you so much for your service and uh, on a retirement well-deserved and good luck on your next chapter. God bless you. Thank you. Okay. Council member Thomas. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Congratulations to you. Thank I'm you. sure when um, before you pursued this career, you had no idea you would be black history or American history, but you definitely are. And um, I'm sure that there's some young girls that look up to you to pursue a similar career path because of the choices that you made. So thank you every day for showing up to the city and doing what needed to be done when people didn't even know you were doing that work. Um, and so enjoy your retirement, um, binge all the TV shows you want to binge, <laughs> have your husband cook all the meals. You don't have to do nothing. Now, I tell them you off. Uh, but congratulations, and it's so good. It's so good to um, congratulate you for your success and your Thank hard work. You. Thank you. Councilmember Robinson. Thank you, Vice Mayor Pro Tem. And Dr. Turner, I just want to add to what my colleagues have said. Uh, your commitment has been not only long and steadfast, but courageous. I really want to emphasize how you've set, stepped into the breach with the department you serve uh, for those who are for lost and lonely, scared, you've been there, and you've been there through the worst of times in our city. And I wanna thank you personally for your tenacity and for being there and for representing the Houston, uh, our city so well over these years. And may you enjoy and have a blessed retirement. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Turner, 32 years deserves to be celebrated. And so we are wholeheartedly supporting and celebrating you and all of your accomplishments with the city of Houston today. Um, and may your latter days be your better days. And I wanna know, what do you plan on doing every day? I'm gonna binge watch <laughs> <laughs> SVU and Chicago PD. Right? <laughs> so yes, yeah, honestly, I really just kinda wanna enjoy retirement for a little bit. Uh, I certainly don't expect to sit around and do nothing, but I am going to give myself a little break. So yes. I actually put myself on a time schedule. I said that I am on retirement through May, and then after that, I may start doing something else again. Well, congratulations Thank again, you. and we wish you the very best. Feel free to come visit us anytime you like. Um, and I bet there are some great City of Houston committees that you <laughs> would be great on after you celebrate your retirement. And if Absolutely. you get a little bored, I bet there's a board or a commission we'd love to have you on. Absolutely. Enjoy your retirement. You and so congratulations much. to you, your husband, as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully we'll be back far enough. <laughs>
Chair now recognizes Council Member Carolyn Evan Shabazz for the invocation and pledge. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I want to thank Pastor Michael Smith for joining us today and thank, thank him for his patience and certainly thank him for his engagement on yesterday at the No, no More Crime uh, press conference and for his engagement in District D. But let me tell you a little something about Pastor Michael B. Smith. He has been the pastor of the South Union Missionary Baptist Church for over 15 years, where he is dedicated to bringing men, women, and children into the family of God, developing the disciples of Jesus Christ by equipping saints for church service, and taking mission into the community and world while demonstrating love toward God and our fellow man. Pastor Smith is a native Louisianan. He earned a degree in business administration from Grambling State University in 1983 and has attended the School of College of Biblical Studies for a more in-depth studying of the Bible. Pastor Smith is married to the and they are the proud parents of five children, LaToya, Mary, Michael, Jeremy, and Ebony. And he has three grandchildren. In the words of, of his congressional members, Pastor Smith has the natural ability to reach out to lighten one's burdens and to soothe one's soul. Thank you, Pastor Smith, if you will pray for us. Thank you. Let us pray. Our Father and our God in heaven, we thank you for this day and we thank you, God, for the opportunity that you've given us to serve your people. We ask, dear Father, that you please forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want to thank you for our mayor. I want to thank you for these council members. I want to thank you, God, for the honorees that have been recognized on today. Uh, for giving service, providing opportunities for all people. We ask, dear God, that you will continue to bless our city as we see uh, crime uh, on the rise in our city. We pray for our public servants, our law enforcement agencies. We pray, dear Father, for those who are judges and those, dear God, who are council members who continuously give their service to your people. I pray even for this meeting to on today as they come together to uh, find ways to make our city even better. I pray, dear God, that you will give them a mind to work together and that your spirit will rule and reign in their midst. Lord, provide them with the wisdom that they need. Provide them with the compassion that they need, that they might better serve your people and make Houston a place where your name gets all glory, honor, and praise. Bless us this day with all we stand in need of. And if there's anything else that we need and we fail to ask you for, please grant according to your riches and glory. For you know what we need even better than we know ourselves. So to God be the glory for all the things you've done and all the things that you will do in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you, again. Pastor Smith. If you will rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thanks again, Pastor Smith. Next will be our roll call. Council members, please prepare to answer the roll call by unmuting yourselves. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Mayor Turner will be absent. Councilmember Peck? Here. Councilmember Jackson? Here. Councilmember Kamen will be absent. Councilmember Evan Chabas? Here. Councilmember Martin? Present. Councilmember Thomas? Present. Councilmember Huffman? Present. Councilmember Cisneros? Here. Councilmember Gallegos? Here. Councilmember Pollard? Here. Councilmember Castex Tatum? Here. Councilmember Knox? Here. Councilmember Robinson? Here. Councilmember Kubash? Here. Councilmember Plummer? Here. And Councilmember Alcorn? Here. 
We need a motion to adopt the minutes of February 1st and 2nd. Cast text Tatum move. Second, Robinson. I'll move and second, in favor, opposed, motion granted. Now we'll review the procedures for conducting this hybrid public session. For council members, please remember to speak slowly and clearly. If you have to leave the meeting, please type that in the chat window and then hang up. This will remove you from the meeting and give us a record of when you left. State your name when making a motion, seconding or tagging. For those joining virtually, if you'd like to speak, please type that into the chat window. The agenda director will be monitoring the chat and will add your name to the queue. Please remember that you must be visible on camera while you are speaking. For the public speakers, let me remind you that in order to be recognized as a public speaker, you had to sign up with the city secretary's office by 3 p.m. yesterday. We will call your name in the order that you signed up. When your name is called, please step up to the podium if you are here in person, press star six to unmute yourself if you are calling in, or click on the microphone icon and the camera icon if you are appearing on camera. You will then have one, two, or three minutes to speak. After your time, the bell will ring. Once the bell rings, you must stop speaking. You may only speak when recognized, and if you speak during the meeting and we have not recognized you, we will mute you. If you speak again, we'll remove you from the weedings. Before we start, are there any procedural motions? Council Member Amy Peck. Thank you. I move to add Sergeant Major James Cabarrus to the end of the three-minute agenda list. Second, Robinson. Motion and second, prove in favor, motion granted. Any other procedural motions? No. Seeing none, Madam Secretary, please call the first speaker. First speaker, Teresa Strong. Hello. Dear council members, as a proud member of BFW Post 8790 Auxiliary in Spring Branch, foreign wars way. I have been the secretary of the auxiliary for the past two years and have come to see how much our veterans are actively involved and supported by post 8790. Houston has one of the largest veteran communities in Texas and it is our auxiliary's honor to help these men and women who have bravely served our country. But more can be done. By renaming Foley Street to veteran of foreign wars way, we are showing our support in a broadly visible way. This is shown in part by support of all the property owners on Foley Street. Even those properties adjacent to Foley Street on, on Long Point are all in favor. It is always with such gratitude that I invite veterans to join us at VFW Post 8790 on Foley Street. How much stronger the proud will be, the pride will be to join VFW Your Post 8790. has expired. Thank you, Ms. Strong. I'll give you, I'll give you 30 seconds to complete your statement. Thank you. Thank you. How much stronger the pride will be to join VFW Post 8790 on Veterans of Foreign Wars Way. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Strong. Uh, this is an agenda item tomorrow, item number 31 on the uh, agenda for tomorrow. And uh, as the son of a veteran from Post 3121 in New Orleans, Louisiana, I will be in favor of it. So thank you. Next speaker. Catherine Alexander. Ms. Alexander is here in person. Please to Mr. Ruiz. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Pro Temp, council members and city officials. My name is Katherine Alexander, and today I am here to secure your confirmation of changing the name of Foley Street to Veterans of Foreign Wars Way. The mission of the Veterans of Foreign Wars is to foster camaraderie among United States veterans of overseas conflicts, to serve our veterans, the military, and our communities, and to advocate on behalf of all veterans. Our vision ensures that veterans are respected for their service, always receive their earned entitlements, and are recognized for the sacrifice they and their loved ones have made on behalf of the, this great country. Foley Street is one block long, north and south, between Long Point and Paco Street. There are only four property owners that have a Foley address, two of which belong to the post 8790. 
We have petitioned for this street name change and have support of the property owners on Foley Street, the adjacent property owners on Long Point, and the Spring Branch Management District, who will provide the signage I've passed out to the design of the street for you to see. Post 8790 was created in 1954 in a small building on Foley Street. In 1973, the post was expanded to the large bunker type building that we have today. Post 8790 is the largest post in the city of Houston Metroplex area, and we service not only Spring Branch, but the surrounding villages and communities. Our presence in Spring Branch is well known throughout the community. We embrace our schools by assisting their students with their sports and education activities. Our local police use our facility for retirement parties and other events. District 8 Council has also used our facility for events and we proudly assist in whatever, wherever we can. What a better way to honor our veterans and active military members than name the street Veterans of Foreign Wars Way. You ask why we choose way instead of lane or drive? Because it is the VFW way, how we do things. I know that many of you have family members who are veterans or you may be a veteran yourself. We do hope you will consider joining a VFW or its auxiliary in your community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alexander. Council Member Amy Peck. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine, for coming today and for all of your work in getting this changed um, and really all the work that you do in the community besides the auxiliary. Um, she also is the um, president of the Spring Branch Central Super Neighborhood hood and on the Spring Branch Management District Board. She does so many things and this is just another great thing to add to the list of the wonderful accomplishments that you've done in our community. So thank you so much. And this is just such a great way to honor so many people. So completely support this item. And former council member Brenda Stardig actually asked me to also say that she supports you in this as well. So thank you um, and for everyone coming today about this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alexander. Next speaker. EA Buddy Grantham. It's been over 14 years since the city of Houston created its own Office of Veteran and Military Affairs, trailblazing its way to, the U to having the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, USAA, naming Houston the best city in America for veterans to live in, as well as being recognized by the Harvard School of Business as having the best run veteran program in the nation, and the employer support of Garden Reserve recognizing the city of Houston as the best large employer in the state of Texas. But the city of leadership wasn't seeking all these accolades. Instead, they were busy building community collaborations to assist our veterans and military members as they integrated into our community with housing, education, employment, medical care, and benefit assistance. Along the way, the Houston, city of Houston has helped build a veterans court, a suicide prevention program, a sobering center with accompanying counseling, as well as coordinating a collaboration of community resource organizations that has virtually ended veteran homelessness in our city. Houston has also helped reinforce and build a supportive social support network for our veterans. The VFW, who has long been a leader in fighting for the needs of veterans, was a recipient of that its assistance. Post 8790 was greatly assisted by the influx of younger veterans with their enthusiasm, innovative ideas, and desires to bond together to help other veterans and those in the community. Today, the combat veterans and auxiliary members of Post 8790 ask that tomorrow you vote in favor of a street name change from Foley to Veterans of Foreign Wars Way. This is yet another opportunity for the city to recognize the efforts of the VSW as a critical partner and vital member of the City of Houston's Coordinated Veteran Outreach Program. I would like to sincerely thank the mayor, Mayor Pro Tem and their staffs, Robert Dimbo from the Veterans and Military Office, the Planning Department, the involved council members and their staffs, agenda team, as well as anyone else who's involved in getting us this far in the process. I look forward to seeing all of you at the street signing unveiling. I'm available for any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Grantham. And I'll say welcome home. Uh, for those who don't know, Buddy was our 
uh, Director of Veterans and Military Office uh, under the Parker administration, and I think way back to Mayor Bill Mayor, White Mayor as White well. Mayor started in 07 yep. with Mayor White. You, you and I worked together for a couple of years along with council members. There's Kubash a lot of and faces Robinson. in here that I worked yes. with over the years, oh. and it is good to be back. Oh, great to see you. Good to, good to have you back home. Uh, council member Sally Alcorn. I was just going to say the same thing, Mayor Pro Tem. Welcome back, and so great to see you. You were the first one, right? You were the yes. first uh, yeah. leader of Robert's, the... my great grandson. Right, right. That's what I thought. <laughs> That's Y'all what do I look thought. Alike. Yeah, no, great job, and you you just continue to do so much for veterans in our city. And thank you for thank you for all you do. I look forward to supporting this item tomorrow. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member David Robinson. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. And, buddy, it's great to have you back. And thank you for your service, adding to what my colleagues have said and the support that Council Member Peck has mentioned within her district. We're all for you on this one. But I don't want you to get off the podium without accepting some of the responsibility for those accolades because mm -hmm. you deserve it. Your leadership has been strong, consistent, and uh, one that's made us very, very proud. So well done, and thank you again. You know, if I may, very shortly, when... Uh, Mayor White asked me to come and start the office. He really only gave me one mission. He said, go make Houston the best place for veterans to live. And with all the support of the city and its, and its council members and the staff, it was an easy job. Yes, and correct me if I'm wrong, at that time we were the first major city to have an office. Yes, sir, we were. Yep. Uh, I went up and studied what New York City did. They had a little bit, but nothing like what we built. Thank you. Council Member Amy Peck. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for your service as well, for everything that you've done for veterans. Um, I mean, you've really paved the way for such a great office and for all of the great things that the city has done for veterans. So thank you so much for everything. And thank you so much, Council Member, for your support for this effort. Council Member Michael Kubash. Thank you, buddy. My brother's a, um, a veteran of uh, Vietnam War. It, it, I believe it takes veterans to understand veterans uh, that served in, uh, in in these war conflicts to understand their needs, and I appreciate uh, your service to our. I think you council members need each other to understand each other too. <laughs> it, you know, we, we all need a support network. Yeah, tip for tip. Who has been you. there and been there? Even then, we don't understand each other. Yeah. Council member Michael Knox joining us virtually. Councilmember Knox. Unmute Michael Knox. Going once, going twice. So on behalf of Councilmember Knox, buddy, uh, good to see you again. God bless. He, as a veteran, he has been also very supportive of the veteran efforts. Awesome. Right. Thank you. Thank you all, everybody. Yes, sir. Next speaker. Sergeant Major James Cabarrus. Mayor Pro okay, Tem and State Council members, good afternoon to you all. VFW, this particular post, it is a gathering place. It is a place that is home to the colors of the United States of America, the Texas flag, the prisoner of war, and missing in action flag. It's a place where engaging leaders can come together and collaborate. It's a place where a sense of community is created. It's a place that provides advocacy for veterans of foreign wars like myself. It's a place that the local recruiting force, recruiting station Houston, will use it on a consistent basis. We gather, we have our meetings, we have our training. Uh, this post has been instrumental uh, to the Marine Corps and all branches of service. So I am fully in support and ask for your support with the name change of the street. Any questions? Thank you, Sergeant Major. Major uh, Council Member Michael Knox. <laughs> okay, I got my technical issues resolved, I think. Uh, I just want to thank the, thank the VFW over there. Uh, they, they live, uh, they're just right around the corner from my house and they do a wonderful uh, number of things for the community. Um, you know, barbecue and different things, fundraising efforts. They're a charitable organization. They just do a great job, not only for the veterans that they that are their members, but also uh, the community at large. And I'm just delighted to have an opportunity to participate in getting this street name changed uh, 
just for them. It's a little bitty street. It's about, you know, five steps long. But at um, uh, any rate, it's important uh, that, that we recognize their their contribution. And of course, as a veteran myself, although not of a foreign war, uh, but as a veteran in general, I appreciate these organizations, what they do. So thank you. Council Member Michael Kubash. Thank you. Would, would you say your name again, sir, for us? Sergeant Major James Cabarrus. So, uh, you know, when ever since I was a young man and to, to see a uniform decorated like yours uh, was always very impressive. And uh, I remember when my brother uh, would come bring his uniform home, his dress uniform. He was in the Navy and, and what it would mean to, for him to wear that when we'd go to church. or something. Uh, I, I appreciate it and I uh, appreciate your service to our country. And right now I know we have uh, a number of our military that are on standby for the possible wars. And, and we just appreciate your, your life and your service to keep us safe. And, uh, and that's very important to us. God bless you. And thank you for wearing the uniform today. Council member Edward Pollard. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem and Sergeant Major. Good to see you again. Uh, I want to thank everyone that's involved in uh, putting forth this initiative, a council member pick for your leadership, but also uh, director Dembo and Dr. Jones, I wanna thank you all for your continued advocacy and being uh, leaders for us here at the city of Houston through the Office of Veterans Affairs. Uh, my father is a Vietnam veteran, served in the Marines, and uh, many of the accomplishments and opportunities that I have is due to his service. So thank you all and look forward to supporting this tomorrow. And thanks again, Sergeant Maber, for, for your selfless service. Uh, God bless you. Um, as I mentioned, my dad was a member of Post 3121 in New Orleans, and my mother was a member of the Ladies Auxiliary. I'm not even sure if they still have the Ladies Auxiliary. But after Hurricane uh, Katrina, uh, they came and lived with us for a little while, so he changed his address, and I still get the monthly 3121 newsletters to my house. And I really enjoy reading them because I catch up on some of the old guys that I remember as I grow older myself. But uh, uh, I love the days and thinking about the, the VFW and all the fun activities, even the bingos on 30 uh, on Thursday nights and the uh, fried chicken dinners that we used to have there uh, and the crawfish balls. And it brings back a smile to my face. So God bless you. I'm sure it's going to be an exciting day tomorrow. And we appreciate what you do on, for our country. So God bless you. Thank you. Sing Lim. Sing Lim. Can you hear me? Go ahead, we can hear you. Hello. Yes, uh, good afternoon, council members. Uh, good. Can you guys hear me? Yes, good afternoon, we can hear you. Good, good afternoon. I'm a I'm a resident of uh, in Houston since 1991, and I've seen a lot of hurricanes and floodings and street floodings and whatnot. And currently, there's a new housing unit that's going to be built um, just adjacent to my community, and I'm just uh, kind of uh, concerned about the flooding issues uh, because uh, it seems to me that the connection, the drainage connection from that uh, new housing project, will be connected to my community, and. Uh, during Harvey, I've seen the, uh, you know, the, the lakes or retention pond, you can call it, and it's rising so high, it's almost up the street. So I'm really concerned about the new housing community that's going to be built just adjacent. And also the fact that um, it's going to add a lot of stress to the schools district around my neighborhood. And I was, I was hoping um, whether we should do a further study on these housing projects. So that, that's all I have, sir, ma'am. Thank you. I know that we had a number of speakers uh, speak on this subject as well. And uh, if Council Member Huffman is joining us virtually, I will ask, is this the development that we referred back to the administration last week? I think it is. It is. So I, I think you'll be pleased with the results. So thank you. Thank next you. Next speaker. Alice Liu. Alice Liu is here. Welcome, Miss Liu. Hello. Hi, my name is Alice Liu. I'm here as a member of the Northeast Action Collective, 
a group of Harvey survivors in Northeast Houston organizing to uh, build power and get flood protection in our communities. The Northeast Ashen Collective is here today at City Hall because the city of Houston continues to neglect the health and well being of people in Northeast Houston by not investing in their drainage system and by providing no way for them to meaningfully participate in drainage investment decisions and by continuing to ignore the risks, risks that this neglect causes. This lack of investment and democratic process is part of a long pattern of Houston failing to provide equal services to black and brown communities. Northeast Houston has a majority open ditch drainage system, but we know that separate systems cannot be equal. 84% of all open ditch drainage in the entire city is in District B and mostly black neighborhoods. The same district has over 50% of subsidized housing for families, the largest creosote deposit in Texas, a concentration of truck and train yards, and the city's biggest landfill. It is also home to many of the city's sewage leaks. While closed drainage is maintained by the city, we are required to maintain open ditches ourselves, which is not equal treatment. Today, I specifically want to speak on issues with the 311 system, which is currently the primary way that the city maintains these ditches. Using this system, which has been in place for the past 20 years, individuals are required to call in each concern separately. But the worse that infrastructure is in general and the larger the problems are, the less 311 works. It's effective for patching small leaks, but we can't actually use 311 to build the significant amount of new infrastructure and investment in, in infrastructure that Northeast Houston needs to be, be protected from flooding. Your time has expired. Thank you, Ms. Liu. Council Member, Vice Mayor Pro Tem, Martha Castex Tatum. Thank you, Ms. Liu. Did you say that 80% of open ditches are in District B? Yes, 84%. 84% of And where, where did you find that statistic at? That, I, I didn't realize that, and I'm, I, I want to um, verify that because I know we have quite a bit of open ditches mm -hmm. as well. So I want to make sure that's a that's a true statement. If it is that a true statement, I don't know. If can we ask Public Works, or or do you do you know where you got the? Um, yeah, this is data. So uh, I know for sure Jim Blackburn has produced a research report with this number. Um, and also, we've been using just publicly available data from the city departments. Okay, thank you. That's that's a staggering um, amount of open ditches, if if that's a true statement. And then the other thing I wanted to um, say is, three one one is is a call center, and I know that most council offices ask residents that once you report something to 311 and get the service request number, that you also report it to your council office. Um, so, so that the council office can also follow those requests. And that seems to work in our office. Um, I know that your council member would definitely be responsive um, to those requests, but I hear you. Um, and I want you to know that the entire council is very concerned about our infrastructure needs. And we're looking at ways to improve our infrastructure every day um, because the issues unfortunately do seem to be compounded in um, our lower economic areas, which coincide a lot of times with being black and brown areas. So I appreciate you coming um, today. Did you have um, any more comments that you wanted to make? Because I know your time did expire. Yeah, thank okay, you very I'll give much. You and the remainder of my time. Um, thank you, and no, I'm done. Okay, all right. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Tarsha Jackson. Thank you, um, thank you, Miss Lou, for coming in. Um, and Vice Mayor Pro Tem, that study that she's talking about, it was actually a study from 2014, which was a ditch study that was conducted from Hurricane Ike. And so I know t Texas Low Income Housing have the original report, and of course I know the city has the report as well. Um, so that's what the numbers from and it's actually 80. I think it's 87% of the open ditches are in District B and Cashmere Garden. And so, but that hasn't been a new ditch study. Um, in regards to the flooding, I know I've been working closely with your your group um, on you know the, the flood projects. We just recently submitted a total of 12 um, SWAT projects, and all these projects are in the middle of H and H studies. And so, um, Public Works has basically let us know that the studies should be done by May. 
Um, and then, of course, the projects will start. But, you know, I shared that with Mr. Blackburn. In fact, um, it was very important that we're collaborating as he's out talking to the constituents in the Northeast Houston. And my office is working with the mayor's team to make sure for these flood mitigation projects are moving forward. Just making sure that we share, that we have the accurate data and we're collaborating and we're working together. So just know that I'm working closely with, you know, the residents and we got some projects on the books. Okay. Thank you. Thank Council you. member Tiffany Thomas. Thank you for coming. Question, are y'all also working with them, congressional representatives, to make sure that the Infrastructure Investment Act funds actually get to us? Because we ain't got it. And, we, and so I'm dealing with a drainage project from a neighborhood that was impacted in 2017 from Harvey. And they, you know, um, the city can't make brick without straw. Right. So the, a large, the, the willingness is there, but we also need the funding. Um, and a large part of that, that was federal dollars, will address some of those projects that we're unable to do through our capital projects, through stormwater drainage, through those small projects that we're able to scale. We're unable to do that. So have y'all been engage, engaging with the federal le uh, delegation? Um, yeah. Can I respond? Um, so, yeah, we know that there's a lot of issues at the national level and also the state level with the GLO and that there's a lot of different sort of channels that the funding has to go through. I think today um, we specifically wanted to address inequities with how the city has been spending drainage funding that is already in under your control. Um, but, yeah, we haven't reached out to uh, we haven't been in contact with Congress members directly. And I think that's a good point. But um, there is inequity at sort of every level, national, state and the city as well. So thank you for bringing that up. Councilmember Thomas again. Ms. I'm sorry, Councilmember Jackson again. My bad. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Lou. Next Thank speaker. Saudis Paguaba. Ms. Saudis Paguaga. Next speaker. Derek Hicks. Derek Hicks. Next speaker. Alice Johnson. Alice Johnson. Next speaker. Mark Wright. Mark Wright. Next speaker. Andrea Terrell. Yes, I'm here. Yes, Ms. Terrell. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Can you, can you see me? Yes, ma'am. Looking good. Okay. Good. Hi. <laughs> so I'm here to offer some constructive citizens, um, criticism to the city of Houston, please, with all due respect. Um, I have 24 years as a process improvement consultant, and I arrived here from Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, yay, <laughs> where I did consulting for the FAA. So I'm here with many problems, it seems like, in Houston, the, last, the least of which is that the city of Houston now has my car impounded. <laughs> and I'd like to um, quickly, I think I have three minutes, I better speed up here on how this has happened and how I think it really should not have happened. So uh, this is in regard to um, city ordinance 26-93, which says that a vehicle cannot legally park on the public street for more than 24 hours. Please, I would like council to think about this ordinance and why it might be in place. I am told by Park Houston that it is there to keep abandoned vehicles off the street. Anybody would understand that. You can't have abandoned vehicles riding around, or, or not riding around, but stationary around, I should say. And you certainly need a way to identify stolen vehicles, and that helps HPD do that for sure. But please consider the impact this ordinance may have on others like myself who have not abandoned their vehicles <laughs> and certainly have not stolen their own vehicle. This is my car. Uh, so I'm here today to give you a play-by-play -play of the nightmare that I've experienced as a result of this, of this and to ask you to really consider the in-depth, if you would, please, ladies and gentlemen, the responsibilities, operations, and procedures of uh, the city of Houston uh, entity within your city government, which is called Park Houston, who, as I understand, has most, if not all, the responsibility of putting this ordinance into action for the city of Houston. Uh, let me quickly go over how it's supposed to work, as I understand. I've done a lot of research. I've spent probably a total of five or six hours on the phone trying to find out what I did wrong, what I will not do wrong again, how to get my car back, and where it is. And I only discovered two hours ago where my car is. It took me all morning to find that out. I don't think it should take that long for a person to find out. 
So the first thing that's supposed to happen is Park Houston receives a 311 request reporting an abandoned vehicle or a vehicle parked on the street for more than 24 hours. A parking compliance officer is then supposed to come by and chalk the vehicle. A warning is placed, only a warning, they can't tow it, on the windshield and says to the citizen or to whoever, you must, you must uh, uh, move your car within 24 hours. First question is, how can anybody go out and move their car every 24 hours? What if you have COVID and you're in the hospital? What if you're pregnant and you have a baby? What if you've gone on vacation? What if, like I have, you were ill and you went to stay with some uh, friends out of town for a few days? So I came back to find out that my car had a warning sticker, okay? I called the number on the warning sticker. This was explained to me that after that warning sticker that if the vehicle is not moved within 24 hours, a $30 citation Your is given. Your time has expired. Then three minutes has gone by. Thank you, Ms. Terry. Yes, ma'am. Three minutes? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'll my give goodness. You I'll give you 30 seconds of mine to wrap up, but all council has received uh, the summary of your different events. But in the city of Houston, the code of ordinance requires us to tow cars that are on a public street longer than 24 hours, but I'll give you 30 seconds to wrap up. Okay, I had a $56 purchase permit to park in front of my street, to park in front of my house. There are actually two. I only park in one, there are two. That's a total of $112. It had a City of Houston sticker on it with two with my address, which matched the address on the house that was parked in front of, and it was towed anyway. And it was towed by a, uh, a uh, I spoke with him, a towing company that had was not even authorized, not even contracted with the city to tow it. And the person who had it towed was not the owner of the property and was not the landlord of the property. It was a, it was just a man who, by the way, uh, had a, a, who in fact had attempted to assault me, who lives, um, it's hard to explain, but at any rate, reporting that to police. He's the person who called 311 you, and he persuaded, okay. I will try to continue next week. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, hold on one second, Ms. Terrell. Uh, <laughs> Vice Mayor Pro Tem Martha Castex Tatum. Ms. Terrell, what is your what is your ask today? My ask is that you really consider, please, the implications of this uh, very severe. I think, without any exceptions, rule. I understand the purpose of the rule, but in the net that you're throwing out, ma'am, I think that you're getting a lot of innocent people involved. I have a five hundred dollar, almost five hundred dollar fee to get my car back as of today. I think it's very unfair. So I heard you say that you had a perm you purchased a permit to park in front of your house. Yes, ma'am. Who did you purchase a permit from? From the city of Houston. They issue permits um, in areas where there is where there is uh, high right. competition for parking spaces, like near Midtown. You can you can do right. that and park there. And the permit was clearly visible. Yes, ma'am, on the car. Uh, I want to ask the city attorney a question. If she had a permit to park and she was towed, is there a remedy for that or how? Is there something that can be done? Uh, because it seems like there's some questionable activity with that tow. So, without, so it's hard to answer that without knowing, without knowing more facts. As I understand parking permits, they allow you to park on a street that you would otherwise not, uh, someone some without a permit would not be allowed to park. It doesn't change the fact that you can't be there more than 24 hours. It just allows oh, you to park on the street. Okay. I don't believe the permit gives you uh, extra privileges other than allowing you to park where others could not park if they didn't have the permit. So if you have a permit, you still have to move your car every 24 hours. So the permit does not give you access to longer parking. It just gives you access to parking. So as we, so the purpose of the permit is just a dedicated space for you. I don't believe this space is dedicated. Every 24 hours? You're just allowed to park on that street. Some, uh, I think, now, the city ordinances have have city ordinances have take certain streets and say that you can't park on them unless you get a permit, and it is really for certain parts of town where parking is hard to find. But it doesn't give you a dedicated spot; it just allows you to park on the street. That's my understanding. Okay. So, for example, it will say that I can park in the twelve hundred block of Smith. It doesn't say where on Smith I park; just that I can park in that block. If you don't have the permit, then you can't park in the block. That's my understanding. 
Okay. Can you visit with her and just make sure that there is nothing that was inappropriate? Because I, I don't know if the situation with the toe was appropriate or not, but can you visit with her and just make sure that we did that correctly? Yes, yeah. just as a, as a side, uh, Ms. Terrell is in District C and Council Member Kamen is not with us today, but I will talk with Council Member Kamen and give her the information and hopefully she'll get back in touch with you, Ms. Terrell, and see what we can uh, can do, if anything. I think ultimately you're asking us for a change in the code of ordinance and uh, that would probably... Yes, sir. Yes. So I will uh, we'll relay this information to your council member and uh, and hopefully uh, Council Member Kamen will get back to you, but we still have Council Member Michael Kubosh in the queue. Thank Mayor you Bruce, so may much. I, may I address the city attorney? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so it's 24 hours continuous. In other words, if you were parked 12 hours, went somewhere, came back, parked again for 12 hours, that wouldn't be considered 24 hours. I mean, how, that is how, correct. how are we going to verify that this car hadn't been moved over during that period of time and gone to the grocery store or something? I'm, I'm trying to understand it. I apologize. So it's my understanding the way parking enforcement handles, handles it, and Ms., I believe Ms. Terrell uh, explained that, they do chalk your vehicle. So the way, the way I understand for parking enforcement is they will put chalk on the vehicle and they will come to see if it's been moved. Yeah. They will I put, remember that. They will put a chalk on, <laughs> on the, the tire of the yes, vehicle. Yes, I like that. Yes. So unless you just were so unlucky that you stopped at the same chalk line as before. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, City Attorney. That really helps me to understand. Yes. And, and, and thanks, Ms. Terrell. We will relay your information to Council Member Abby Kamen as well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next speaker. Robert Soap. Robert Choate. Next speaker. Reverend Willie Davis. Reverend Davis, good afternoon. Set my timer here. Good afternoon, Mayor <clears throat> Pro, and to Council, and all of you, it's good to be here. It's good to see you, ladies and gentlemen, have some laughter and celebratory today, and see my rubber stamp man, Robertson, is still here. I'm here to talk about the mayor's initiative, this One Safe Houston initiative, um, which I think is very grievous and very disrespectful to the city. It's good to know you all can laugh inside council and many people out there are crying outside in our communities. This piece of paperwork is not worth what it was written on. And let me explain why, because first of all, in the opening of this press release regarding this initiative, it says it's a combat, a comprehensive combat. I'm a veteran, as I heard the veterans get honored and gratefully so far, I'm a Vietnam vet and a combat soldier. There ain't nothing combative about this initiative. And I would hope that council would take the position as the people that you are and not rubber stamp something just because it's initiated by the mayor or Kami or Abby, whoever put this together because there's nothing in here that comes back to crime. Anyone that know anything about crime or had an experience of crime know that this is certainly not anything that come back crime in the city of Houston. Many of you, I know a lot of people here was migrating in this town. I was born in this town and raised in this town, educated in this town. And this is not the Houston that I've always knew and was great, grew in and educated in. The crime in our city is out of control. It's disrespectful. And I heard count, one of the councilmen talk about when the veterans put together this program that it was the first in Houston. Well, guess what? Ladies and gentlemen, the first of this year, Houston was the murder capital of this country. And that's the first for this city. I've been here all my life. I raised my children here. I went to college from here and served the United States Army from here. 
And the first thing that is so idiotic about this, it opens up talking about gun buyback. Who in the world you think a criminal is going to sell a gun to the city? That lets you know the person that put this together is totally irresponsible. Is we all right now? This leadership, this administration, council have blood on their hands. What's going on in our city? I've said this to Channel Twenty Six. I said it to others, and I say it today. Why would you buy back a gun? I got a girlfriend named Beretta, and she has seventeen sisters. And wherever I go, she go. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Councilman Brad Pollard. Hold on, Reg. Sure, Reverend. Uh, Thank you for being here and for your comments. Um, I know you may be displeased with the uh, initiative that was rolled out. Um, tell me what improvements or changes you would like to see. What are your ideas? That, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked. You know, a few years back, I talked about let's keep Houston safe. And a lot of people ignored that, even though the whole process, Says to that, of course, you know, I'm not a cheater. I believe in doing and doing something, do it right and, and respect the winning. But let me tell you, leadership is progressive. Leadership don't do knee jerk reactions. Leadership see vision. Crime has been going up in this city, councilman, for years. And over the past six years, crime has been going up. So let me tell you what needs to be done. Nobody would ask me, and I know they wouldn't ask me. But let me tell you something. Number one, identify where the real problem is. Number one, we brought a police chief in this city that did not only know how to be a chief, but disrespected the city and, and drew down morale among the police department. And people in this city know it and don't want to talk about it. So number one, we need to make sure that this city have more cops. We need more police officers. And we need to treat them. I never... Nothing more embarrassing in my city to see a city that turns fire department against police department. That's stupid. The other thing we need to do is identify where the crime really is. They don't want to talk about this gang violence in this city. And most of the people that don't have street, street knowledge, you don't know a gang bang if you saw one. And you don't even know how the gangs get initiated. There's a lot of initiatives that can come from the community McGregor and Riverside just had a meeting and asked the city to come to them. The, the city council in America should be going to the to the community. So that's one particular thing, and there's many others. Well, in this particular initiative, the mayor is putting forth dollars for 125 more officers on the street per day. And although that may not be an overall solution, it is putting more boots on the ground to try to deter the crime that we do have. Uh, when you look at a comprehensive plan to combat crime, it's going to not just be placed on, on the city as well. And we have to always understand that. You have the city of Houston, and then you have our judicial system, you have our DA system, and you have the community. It all plays a role. Police officers usually d try to deter crime. Police officers usually show up after a crime is committed. And we try to back our police department with as many resources as possible so that they can do their job. But the city of Houston alone cannot solve the crime problem. We can, take the, we can take the lead, but we're gonna need not only the community and the faith-based community as well, but the DA's office, our judicial system, and all other entities that play a role in combating crime, or at least addressing crime, to let me change the word, okay? Um, but I do believe that the mayor put forth a lot of uh, thought and diligence in putting together this plan. And it may not be a one-size-fits-all approach, but I do think it is putting dollars and resources in the hands of different entities that will help shape um, the direction of our, our, our crime issues. The reason I ask you for your ideas is I do believe that it takes more than just us sitting around this horseshoe to come up with solutions. And people like yourselves and others who may be in attendance or are listening to this, we invite you all to please send us your ideas and find ways in which we can collaborate with the community to address these problems. Because we know that crime is the number one issue, 
Public safety is the number one issue for all of our offices, um, but it's going to take all of us working together uh, to address that. Thank you. Okay. Council Pollard, may I respond? Yes. yes, go ahead. Well, first of all, I'm not questioning the mayor's effort. Let me be clear about that. And I thought I was. I'm not questioning the mayor's effort. A lot of people are having efforts. The, the, the chief fender is having an effort. If you talk to every one of the county politicians, everybody, everybody have an effort. When I, I'm not speaking to people's effort. I'm speaking to what is put in print. I would, I would suggest that this council, as long as this administration take a progressive and, ex, and, and look for experienced people that have dealt with crime. I grew up in this city on the street in Third Ward, Texas. I'm from the trade. I know what it looks like and I know what it is. I don't show up. Councilmember Michael Kubash. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Motion, motion to extend. So Second. All those in favor, opposed, motion granted. Councilmember Kubash. Uh, Pastor Davis, thank you for your service to our nation. I appreciate that. You I'm, I'm always well, honored uh, to have people who have served and are certainly veterans of foreign war. Um, my concern is is that spending money that, that's not going to the true cause uh, or, or the to fix the problem, and and I think that there's there's a, there's more money that needs to be going to our police department uh, for protection. Uh, we are we're having so many of our officers retiring, and we need to really beef our police department up. We need more officers. That's that's what Mayor Lanier did years ago. He he promised uh, something and he kept his word, and he got more police officers present. When you have a police officer uh, a present, uh, it's, it's much less likely there's going to be a crime. Uh, you greatly reduce crime. And even though the mayor has put 124, five, 125 more boots on the ground through overtime, we really need to make sure we bring in more officers uh, and train them. There's also a concern about this gun buyback. I, I think that's a million-dollar waste. All you're doing is... is um, is actually buying guns from people that aren't criminals. Exactly. You know, and and um, one of the things that I did a few weeks ago, and I'm sure you you are aware of it, was that I, I called a press conference that I was going to be calling out the judges. I am who who have uh, who have released habitual violent offenders with multiple offense criminal offenses felonies, mm -hmm. and have released released them back into the community either on a free bond, a PR bond, personal cognizant, or a very low bond. Or a bond they were able to make that they shouldn't have been able to, and of course uh, the the share, the the judges are at fault there, and and I have filed uh, twelve judicial bar complaints at this time, and I'm working on four more tonight and, and this week. It's important for us to get the word out. When the media call me and some of the national media outlets, why are you doing this? I said so that I can draw attention to what's going on here in Houston, that violent habitual offenders are being released back into the community and they're killing people and we've right. got to stop it. That's right. And we have to increase our police department. I, I know that you have, uh, you, you're in the community and you see what's going on. Mm -hmm. it, it's important to me that, that we try to somehow or another work together, even though we have to call people out, we still need to, to realize that these judges are in office. They need to stop it. They need to stop doing what they're doing. Now, I, and, and perhaps uh, there's other issues that we need to address. Mm -hmm. And I know the mayor keeps bringing up the fact that we can all legally carry now without a, getting a permit. But the truth of the matter is uh, only that we really, that's really not the big problem. The big problem is, it is the crime that's, that's overwhelming us. These, these misdemeanor crimes uh, are, are not being adjudicated. One, one individual was caught with 22 uh, catalytic converters in the back of his car. Mm -hmm. he, got, uh, he got arraigned. He got released. He's back out on the street. They're misdemeanors. And they caught him again, asking why he, why he had these in his car, because he said, you know, took my other ones. So he's right back to doing it. Have your, have your windshield broken out of your car or, Absolutely. Your, or your window and, and, and go and look and, and call the police. And they're not going to come. They're going to tell you to file a report online. There is a reason for we're overwhelmed with misdemeanor crimes. Absolutely. And, and we're just giving them free bonds and putting them right back out. Did, did you see anything like this years ago when you were in the community? Absolutely not. And let me and let me just say, Council Kubash, I, I want to just throw out, and I'm not personalizing anyone, but listen, I'm going to say what I say, 
and I speak what I speak, and I speak it to everybody, including the mayor. It ain't personal with me, but it, but it, but it is a deep concern because I live in this city. I grew up in this city. This is my city. I served in another major city for four years, Chicago, Illinois, and they've been having buyback guns for years. It has never worked. You're talking about a city buyback guns with 760 homicides. Houston is not, we are not that people. Thank you, Council Member anyway. Carolyn Evan Shabazz. Motion to extend. So move. Motion second. Second. I'll second. I'll second. It. I'll second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion granted. Council Member Carolyn Evan Shabazz. Thank you, Pastor Davis, for coming forward uh, with you. your recommendations. On yesterday, there was a uh, No More Crime press conference at the Good Hope Church. And at that time, I spoke to the community to tell them how some of these organizations that I know work with gang activities, such as Reginald Gordon and, and certainly uh, Deloitte Parker and others, that they need uh, funding. And you know, I was taught that if you look at a person's checkbook, you will know what they value. And so I'm, I'm asking that people support some of these organizations that address uh, gang activity uh, because the city can't do it alone. And so um, the I know that uh, in District D, we're working to have a permanent location for uh, Reginald Gordon and, and his organization to be able to interact with uh, people who are engaged in gang activity. And Chief Fenner is being on the front, has been on the forefront with trying to accommodate that group. But I also have to say that, you know, we put a lot of uh, onus on the judges, but I got a, a, an insert with a tutorial, so to speak, that it's not necessarily the sitting judges that are doing these bonds, but it's the magistrate judges that are uh, overlooking the recommendations recommendations of the district attorney, where in some cases they are saying no bond. And so, you know, that that is a problem. But we certainly, and I think that it has been, we have to look at the bail bondsmen as well to see that they are lowering the amount, the percentage of the uh, bond that is required. So it's not just on the judges. You know, the backlog we've certainly addressed. But certainly this is something that we're all going to have to to have blood on our hands for, because it's something that's happening that um, we can't totally control. And it's going on throughout the country. And so certainly I appreciate you coming forward. Thank you. And um, as always, you've always been very engaged and you and I have a, a, a great relationship. Mm -hmm. But we have to look at the, at the big picture. It's not we can't just put our finger on one thing and think that we're going to have uh, a solution one way. And, so and thank you so very much coming forward. Thank you. And that was that was really my point today. This this initiative does not meet the match and no one asked me and if they would have I would have told them, but the truth of the matter is there's a lot of issues around that. Matter of fact, it was a bill that went to the state legislature that would have given judges. The judges say, "Well, we under the law and we can't give out but only a certain amount of bail bonds." And now they're trying to say the bail bonds need to start raising their prices. Well, that was a piece of legislature in the state that would have given judges the discretion, the discretion Absolutely. to raise their their uh, uh, the bonds, and a, a section of the state legislature voted against it. Nobody talks about that. Absolutely Council, Council Michael Pastor Knox. Davis, I'm going to say I had a conversation uh, with Andy Kahn with mm -hmm. Crime Stoppers yesterday, and he yes. shared that with me, and I found that to be appalling. So thank you so very much. You're the, the sitting judge should have some discretion. They're certainly the ones that are being faulted for this. So they certainly should have some discretion motion to in extend. regards to changing bonds. Thank you. Second. All those in favor, opposed, motion granted. Council Member Knox. Uh, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to belabor the point. I think several of them had been made, but I want to remind everybody about uh, former mayor and former police chief Lee P. Brown wrote a book. Yep. Uh, that all of us police officers, if we wanted to take a sergeant's exam, had to read. And in that book, he says that it's not so much important that people are actually safe. It's important that they feel safe. And I think right. this is a problem with elected officials all around the state and all around this this county and wherever we are. 
that uh, it really does matter. People do need to be actually safe. And uh, I agree with you um, th- that the uh, the buyback program is it creates a market for stolen guns. Uh, it's not going to be people that own them that turn them into too much. In most cities where this happens, you see burglaries of residents are on the increase. Burglaries of motor vehicles are on the increase. And that's criminals looking for guns that they can go sell back to the city without any repercussion that's whatsoever. Right. The Cure Violence program that the mayor proposes has failed in almost every city that it's tried. It sounds good. It, it looks good. It feels good. <laughs> but the actual results are mixed at best and at worst are just ineffective. So what, what you have here is uh, it's not our police department that's a problem. Our police are out there arresting people Absolutely. all the time. <clears throat> and so the problem is the community itself is getting to the point where they see that, you know, maybe there wouldn't be a crime if the police weren't there. So it's the idea that the police are somehow responsible for crime and they're not. Um the criminal justice system is complicated, and it's uh, it's difficult to deal with, and it takes effort on everyone's part. All I can say is that uh, what we've seen from the mayor's program so far, I believe, it's been more let's make people feel safe than actually make them safe. And I'd prefer that we actually make them safe with more police officers, accountability, and send these people to prison. You know, most of our backlog um, – is is not new criminals. It's the same criminals committing increasingly numbers of offenses that are getting backed up along the way. And uh, so I agree with you, Pastor, that uh, you. that we need more proactive in, in this sort of thing. So yeah. thank you for your time. Thank you, and I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Reverend Davis. Thank you. Next speaker, Reverend Earl Jones. Good afternoon, Reverend Jones. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem and the City Council for allowing me to be here to speak. And I think that's a good segue at the last segment. Um, I'm a, a pastor, of Refu- uh, one of the pastors at Re- Refuge Temple Ministries in Humble, Texas. And we have uh, been intensely involved in the community uh, and outreach efforts for the last 40 years. We have a, a 5013C um, organization called Highway and Hedges. It has about 400 members, and we um, target communities that have high crime, drug, and violence issues. Uh, As a team, they converge on these neighborhoods and going from door to door, offering hope, prayer, comfort, and the Word of God. Uh, The neighbors are invited to attend a a public outreach event scheduled later that day. And this uh, event features music, testimonies uh, from former drug addicts, gang members, former felons, former school, uh, school dropouts. The common message is that you can change your heart and you can change your situation. We feel that the most effective way of combating crime is to get crime out of the hearts of people. But to do that, they have to have hope. We bring hope. We show people a way out of their despair. We believe that one person can make a difference. We believe that one person can change a family. One family can change a neighborhood. One neighborhood can change a community. We have, uh, we have members on this team that once fought police. Now they're leading and partnering with police to getting crimes out of neighborhoods. We're partnering with uh, the police departments in Dallas, Texas in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in Lake Charles, Louisiana, in Monroe, Louisiana, and also with uh, uh, Chief Troy Finner in the Houston uh, Police Department. Now, our ministry, um, this Highway and Hedges, we uh, have invested over $500,000 in a a portable concert stage. We have a 60,000 amp Caterpillar generator. We have line array speakers. We have a billboard size video uh, LED wall panels to, uh, to use in these events. All of our events are free to the public. We don't sell anything. We don't take, we don't solicit for any donations. My purpose here today is to affirm our desire to help the community and to point out an area where we need help from you. 
Uh, we recently submitted an application to uh, for Discovery Green, and we were given a discounted quote of five thousand dollars per day, plus a laundry list of other fees. Now we are doing a service to the community. Thank you, Reverend Jones. I'll give you thirty seconds of my time to finish up and. and Appreciate what you do for our folks in the Lake Houston area. So go ahead and finish up. Well, thank you. We feel that if we are given free access to a parks, we can reach more people in more neighborhoods that are experiencing high crime. We are here to offer a service to the community, but we need your help in the disposition of those fees and service charges. Uh, we want to do our work and work and partner with the city of Houston and the, also the officials in Harris County. We uh, t we've targeted before uh, COVID. Haverstock, Greens Point, CUNY Homes, Garden Cities, South Lawn, Kings Row, and Crofton Place. Um, and also, we do have some material that we can share with you electronically after this meeting. Motion to extend. Oh, Second. Second. All those in favor, opposed. Motion grants. And Council Member Kubash. Thank you, Pastor, for coming. You know, one of my concerns during the pandemic was the closure of so many of our churches for such a long period of time. You know, there's a scripture in the New Testament that says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but by exhorting one another so much the more. I, I believe the church is the standard bearer for the community, the righteous standard bearer. And uh, when the church is closed, I, you know, they, there's an old saying where, where sin doeth abound, grace doeth that much more abound. But yet the, the crime has gone up, as a, and I believe it's also affected by the churches being closed. People need a place to go and worship and, and to express uh, you know, their feelings toward their God. I think we see the, the, the divorces and, and the family violence increasing. Uh, I, I know that there's, a, there's something happens to me every time I go to church and I leave church. I feel there's a certain feeling I feel as I leave. You know, perhaps it's because I've honored the Lord's day. Whatever it is, I believe that we all have a tendency to, to feel closer to our maker and to our God. And, and I believe it brings us more in respect of our, of our neighbors and those others. I believe most of the people in the community would hurt, would allow themselves to be hurt before they would hurt someone else. But yet we, we need our churches. We need our places of worship. We need our synagogues. We need our mosques. We need those places of worship. And, and having closed them, I believe, has really allowed a lot of things to happen that otherwise perhaps wouldn't have happened. So, you know, I thank you for coming. Uh, you know, we're fighting on the same front, and we need to make sure that, that we, we keep our people safe. Thank Council, you very much. Council Member Tarsha Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Jones, for coming in and sharing, you know, information you. about your organization. I'm the representative for District B, and so Umbel is, some Umbel is in my um, area, and so I'm really interested in what you're working on. You say that you're trying to combat or, like, work on crime. Um, one of the issues, you know, my theory of change is um, addressing poverty, and so um, that's one way that we can address crime is get people on some good pan, in some good paying jobs. Um, in our district, we have over 40% of the people making under $25,000 a year. So my question to you, do you have job opportunities or what other programs do your organization offer um, to you know, help give people hope um, in, in these particular neighborhoods? Good question. And uh, we, uh, we, uh, we offer, of course, the gospel, uh, but we also refer them to resources, the existing resources. But one of the things that we do is that when we go out and uh, we go door to door, apartment complexes and in neighborhoods, but we, uh, we get their contact information, we call them. And because many times you can tell a person that they need to change, but they don't know how to. They don't even know what resources are available to even help them. And so we stay in contact with them. Uh, we, we, and we, we help them in many, as many ways as we can, but many times it's through referrals. Okay, well, I look forward to working with you, okay? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Jones. Appreciate it. Thank you. The next, next speaker. speaker is Derek Henderson. Mr. Henderson. Next speaker. Michael Finnell. Michael Finnell. I got gotcha. you.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Michael Fennell, and uh, I'm here today to address issues with a Houston-based company, ExxonMobil. I am a pro se litigant against ExxonMobil. Once again, my name is Michael Fennell. You can view that on, a, on the court dockets. The extreme hostility, sabotage, and racial treatment I received at the hands of ExxonMobil is inexcusable, and I'm certain my case, this case, will be one of the biggest discrimination cases in the state of Texas. Corporate knowledge infringe on justice, and especially racial justice in the state of Texas. I was told, and the research has suggested, due to ex excessive lobbying, there's little to no recourse to these actions, which does not deter corporate behavior. I am determined to make this a national issue. Justice is on the line as the courtroom has become the weapon, especially when discrimination is called out in the corporations that control the laws. There's definitely need to be changed in Texas at the legislation, legislative level. If need be, I will be willing to drop my case and use the facts gathered of ExxonMobil evil doing if it will promote change. My mission is to expose ExxonMobil while the do-nothing investors like Vanguard, BlackRock, State Street, Castor just sit and do nothing. Exxon partners with Rosneft and the begin at the beginning of the former guy presidency could likely be, play a part of what's going on in the world today. Exxon plays a big part in the Russian pipeline and the corruption. Tillerson was Putin's ambassador and a titular head of racist few extremists who pollute pristine land. Pristine land. There are many environmental infractions ExxonMobil is allowing to happen as we speak in the name of sheltering themselves from their racist ways. Former guy allowed them to embrace the culture. Now they scramble to erase, to erase the intentional harm. ExxonMobil had a lockout of over 600 people to avoid a large class action lawsuit and has been working together with, with local union leaders to avoid their own demise as these so-called leaders use their own leverage to save themselves while so many minorities have been sacrificed over the years. Anyone with common sense would know that safety and seniority is not a reason to, to lock out people for over 10 months from their job causing hardship. The intentions was to cause so much financial hardship that everyone would forget and have fear of the intention and the extreme racism endured by many from 2015 to 2020 thus hoping to single me out for not changing my story and having the evidence to prove this. The local and national media was controlled and misled by lies as I refused to be interviewed and acknowledged by local news as ExxonMobil money and donations control entire counties. Imagine having your life destroyed by a notorious entity, threatened, accosted, followed, watched, invasions of your privacy via your personal devices, your cell phones, your computer, altering and changing, changing your life. Your time have expired. Thank you, Mr. Fennell. No speakers in the queue. Next speaker. A. Marie. A. Marie. There are no speakers. Oh, okay. A. Marie. Next speaker. Rebecca Sale. Rebecca Sale. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Um, my name is Becky Sell. I'm part of West Street Recovery in the Northeast Action Collective, um, along with Alice Liu, who spoke earlier. So um, we are passing around a packet right now that goes into a little more detail of what Alice was talking about. And on the front page, you'll see the demands we've arrived at. But um, those have come from working together since Harvey to try to advocate for uh, better drainage in Northeast Houston. 
we've worked with uh, Council Member Tarsha Jackson a lot and Dr. Plummer. Um, and yeah, we're here today to try to basically move forward better with the city to um, see some actual changes. So I want to focus on our fourth demand, which is to make drainage infrastructure governance more transparent, accessible, and democratic. So we went into about six months ago, we just started really trying to understand what, what are the ways what are the ways projects happen um, so that we could figure out where where can we give community input, like where is it actually possible to get changes in our neighborhoods. And what we found was a really, really confusing system with different answers from everyone we talked to. Um, and we basically kept hearing that we just need to trust the system and that a worst first approach is being, uh, being taken. But what we're seeing on the ground is the actual conditions of drainage haven't really changed. And when we've looked through plans ourselves and uh, maps that Texas Housers has put out, it shows that drainage infrastructure money is being spent very inequitably. So if you look at the last four pages of the packet, basically we've taken a go at actually describing all of the um, money that's available to be spent. And um, yeah, we think that this is something the city should the city should do. And our ask, one of our main asks is that the it's easier to understand like what programs are there actually and that plans are published online. So right now really the only thing you can find online is the CIP plan. So not even records, public records of like what SWAT projects are planned or what LDP projects are planned. Um, and there's absolutely no records of what money has actually been spent. And we think that that's really something the public has a right to know. When you look through CIP plans, you can see that the plans rarely happen. There's a lot of good reasons, right? We have extreme weather events and different projects are delayed for different reasons. But um, we can't just trust the plans and trust this vague answer that a worse first approach is being taken. So um, we filed a freedom or a public information request um, about 30 days ago now. And we uh, were told last, on the 14th, so over a week ago. Thank you, Ms. Sale. Uh, Council Member Tarsha Jackson. Thank you, and thank you, Rebecca, for coming in. Did you guys share this, this report with my office? Uh, I don't know if we emailed it, maybe this morning, but we'll email it after this. Uh, okay, all yeah. right, all right, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Council Member Ed Pollard. Uh, Rebecca, thank you for coming forward, and uh, thank you for this information. I think um, this issue is something that needs to be addressed. Um, many times it can be confusing to get all the right answers, but I think you all are going about it in the right way as a collective. And um, it, it takes a lot of time to advocacy of others uh, to be able to spotlight some of the deficiencies that we have here in the city, and I think that's what you all are doing. I'm definitely going to take some time to read the information uh, that you all have provided and uh, we'll hope to provide some feedback as well but please stay in contact with my office even though i don't represent that side of town i'll stay in touch with council member jackson uh, but i think the work that you all are doing needs to be uh commended and i want to thank you for it because i i do believe it will uh come with meaningful change thank you thank you council member david robinson uh, Becky, thank you for coming here and for this in-depth information. Sounded like you were trying to conclude the thought there at the end of your remarks. Do you want to? Do you want to uh, take a moment of my time? I wish I remembered what I was saying. Yeah, uh -huh. I, I understand. <laughs> Part of it was how complicated it is, which is yeah. uh, in the understatement of the day, I think. But it is really tricky, and uh, the fact that we have not had the CIP meetings uh, as we did pre-pandemic. Uh, I think in some ways has contributed to the challenge of communicating the complexity of all this. So I don't know if that uh, sparked any memory of where you were in your <laughs> remarks, but. Um, yeah, I think that it is a very complex system, but there's there are a lot of like pretty actionable things the city could do very easily to make it uh, like more transparent and easier to understand. I think the, the biggest one of all for us is public records of how money has been spent. That information's impossible to find. And in, in filing, oh yeah, we filed a public information act. It's been 
over the time when you're supposed to hear a response already. We filed a few different ones. Another one came back with a $600 fee attached to it for pretty simple records. And then after back and forth of questions for a couple weeks, it was somehow reduced to $45 and we got all the information. So there's just, even when you start to dig, it, it's, it's very, I guess, yeah, we want the plans the city has to be there for people to see and records of how money was spent. And I've just gotten a note to that effect. I think you were talking about the TPIA yes. request that you were looking for, which is yes. what you're talking about. Yeah, now. so we still have an open one with the city we're waiting for a response in. And we've asked in that for records of CIP spending over the last five years, basically, and breakdowns. Because if you look through the CIP budget, um, there's a lot of projects. There's some projects you can understand where they are. There's other projects that are very vague or they're just pots of money. So LD, L, local drainage projects, for example, is just a pot of money. And then there's no information available on where that money was spent or the decision-making process on how that money is spent. So I ask now is basically we can't blindly trust that decisions are being made in our best interest because the history is they aren't. And so, yeah, we want to work together in being able to do that. Yeah, and I think building on what Alice said earlier today and perhaps what some other folks are going to say here in a moment, um, you know, we want to help and come alongside Council Member Jackson in her district and uh, put some meat behind the statement of 84% of the open ditches and so forth. We want to, we really want to get to the bottom of that. The committee I chair is TTI, which is perhaps where we would vet some of this publicly. Okay. So I appreciate your, um, your input and in coming before. Uh, council today and whatever our office can do, please keep me in mind and we'll reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Tasha Jackson. Yes, and I also want to add that the, um, again, thank you for your, your leadership and your work. We've been working a long time on, you know, the drainage issues within District B, but there's also a, um, District B has an environmental committee Environmental Justice Committee, and I think folks from your team has been serving on that committee to whether creating a um, drainage a maintenance plan. Um, so there, you know, we have the Be Prepared initiative to where we're coming up with ways to where we can be prepared to prevent flooding or when a storm ha um, happened. But, you know, and one of it is drainage maintenance schedule. And so I know you guys are working on that. I just want to add that there is some activity happening, um, but we still have a lot of work to do. So. Yeah. Yeah. Going with that, like another frustrating thing is that, like, I mean, you know, you walk down the street in District B, the drains don't work anywhere. Like, there, it's an impossible task to like say which street necessarily needs it the most and to just like start with that assumption and for there to be a more proactive approach of, um, you know, knowing the spark. Thank you. And just as an FYI, I did receive a text message from Stephen Costello, who's our chief recovery officer, and uh, I will give him a copy of your handout and I'm sure he'll Great, and the uh, Northeast and Action Collective would love to meet with him if possible. Pass right. that on. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Next speaker. The next speaker is Carolyn Rivera. Good afternoon. I'm Carolyn Rivera. Thank you. Sorry about that. I'm Carolyn Rivera. I have lived in Cedicast, Northeast Houston for 42, 42 years. Low income, elderly, and vulnerable people suffer daily with fear as we watch our lives be in danger and our property deteriorating. I am here today because the time is now to get rid of the antiquated, non-folk functioning sewage and ditch drainage system and lack of maintenance on the system. This system holds contaminated, polluted, standing water with fecal matter, solid waste, and toxins. We have the largest cancer cluster in Texas, our area. For years, my group and I have tried to communicate with the city to get action. We are told that projects are soon to come or equitable 
funding. Yet nothing is done and the astronomical problem continues to escalate. We need transparency, truth and action immediately. We're not going away because our lives are in danger, important and worth fighting for. Last week, I spoke to Mr. Sandoval, City of Houston Public Works. We discussed some of the problem and he assured me that he will contact the proper people. I have heard these promises before from the city with no action for years. However, I plan and plan to work with the groups that help us to continue going. We will not stop. Property, physical and mental health is in major trouble in city gas in Northeast Houston because of an antiquated, non-working sewage and drainage system. And these are facts. Thank you, Councilmember Tarsha Jackson. Thank you for um, coming in, and I, I share your frustration. I do. I mean, I um, every time it rains over in the area, I'm getting phone calls about people's homes are actually flooding. I mean, we we just had a small rain, and water went into one of the residents' homes. And so, just know that I've had conversations with the mayor. Um, this H and H study kind of slowed up the process. I was very frustrated because. There was no study done already in our neighborhood. It's like, why am I when I submit some projects, you're telling me I have to wait a year for a study that should have been done after Hurricane um, Harvey. And so just know that I'm advocating, um, trying to make sure that we get the resources we need to get these, especially as tw 12 SWAT projects that we need moving forward on. Um, I also talked with Lena Hidalgo, Judge Hidalgo. She has committed to putting some resources from the county on some of these projects. So just know you have a group of folks that's advocating, trying to get the dollars that we need. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rivera. Thank you, and thank you. Next speaker. Doris Brown. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Doris Brown, and I live in Scenic Woods. I have lived here for 54 years. I am providing public comment today because my neighborhood and other BIPOC communities like it have not received sufficient drainage investment. This means our community floods, even during normal rainfalls, and major rainfalls like Imelda Harvey are catastrophic. Street flooding might not seem like a big deal, but it has huge impacts. Street flooding limits my mobility and my opportunities. Sometimes I cannot leave my home because the streets are impassable. Neighborhood children have to wade through stagnant water to get to the school bus. The seniors with disabilities cannot get to their metro lift rides for doctor appointments or dialysis. The constant flooding is really bad for my mental health. From Allison to Harvey, we have seen so much flooding that high water on our streets is traumatic. I'm scared for myself and my family. Rain and poor drainage make me feel anxious, depressed, and angry. I know that other communities have drainage that works, but we continue to be excluded. Flooding is also a risk to my physical health. As you know, the Justice Department has created a consent decree with the city of Houston because of sewage leaks and overflows concentrated in black and brown communities. When there is standing water, that water contains fecal matter and other solid waste that is dangerous. Our neighborhoods are home to the largest cancer cluster in Texas, which you won't address. The biggest landfall in the city and dozens of truck deposits and train yards that are full of toxins in Northeast Houston. The standing water contains all of these hazards and has negative health effects. Furthermore, even clean standing water is a disease source. From malaria to Zika, it breeds mosquitoes that engender us. How do companies open up cement batches next to schools? 
big trucks flying down the street spewing diesel and tearing up the already fragile streets and roads. Street flooding should lower my property value and other financial impacts. Bad smells from standing water are unpleasant. Water degrades roads which damage cars and look bad. Flooded lawns make our communities look worse. Together, this should lower house values and therefore the ability of BIPOC people to be a wealth. You may know that white households have about 10 times as much wealth as black households. Maybe your negligence is actually part of that. I live in a deed restricted neighborhood, but from lack of city enforcement. Your time has expired. Council Member Elkin. Thank you, you wanna wrap up your comments quickly and then I have a question. Thank you. I live in deed restricted neighborhood, but from lack of city enforcement, developers have invaded our neighborhoods, buying up property in black, indigenous, people of color communities, and, uh, and built large mansion type houses in an effort to tax us out and make us homeless. Is this the plan? They said rede redevelopment, but it's gentrification to drive the LMI further into poor, underserved communities. With our community, will our communities follow the way of historic fourth and third war? All we ask is that you invest in our communities. Use the worst first bottle. Thank you for your comments. You had a question. Council Thank you, Ms. Brown, Brown very, very much for your comments. And I wanted to know if you were aware that the, the city of Houston did put in applications for some of the hazard mitigation, not the hazard mitigation, the GLO funds, the CDBG MIT funds for two big projects in Northeast Houston. Yes, Which, I'm aware of that. Yes, and that those the GLO denied all of our applications. Right. We we went to the county. We talked about that. We okay. We do, so just want to make the same sure thing there that we're doing here now. Looking at the state to the state as well with this money. I mean, we we need the money for urban drainage. You make right. a lot of good points in in your statement. We need the money to fix the urban drainage in areas like yours. Yes, and we so, actually filed a Title Six against the GLO. All right. Thank you very much. And and I was attending to something in the back when the first speaker came, but I want to say to your collective that this is good work that I'm reading here. And thank you for what you've done here. I do believe we need increased transparency in our the spending of our public dollars on capital projects. And uh, I appreciate how you broke it down. And, and you can see kind of where the public would get pretty frustrated in trying to figure out not just where the money is planning to be spent, but where it has already been spent. So I appreciate this work. Um, this, there's a lot of good work in this, and I look forward to reading it more in depth. All right. Thank you. Council Member Thomas. Hold on. Uh, thank you. Ms. Brown. Yes. Um, I think this question that I have really came from um, some statement Ms. Rebecca made, but on, in your conclusion of your remarks, you said, you know, uh, talking about the worst. Are you, I haven't had a chance to read through the report that was, was shared, but are y'all offering some type of prioritization of the drain because y'all have so many? Um, are, is there a recommendation for how we prioritize that um, in addition to the replacing the sewage system that we uh, voted on with the uh, water fee, I think earlier this summer, which supports some of that sewage work. Is there something like that that y'all are offering? Yes, we have We have some recommendations. We also have some neighborhoods and communities out there that do not have drains. Okay. I mean, there are no drains for the water. There's no place for the water to go. Water stays in the street four and five days, and that's just after hard rain. No. And this is historically, you know, this is something that's been going on. I have been out there for 54 years. Right. It's ongoing. Yeah, I'm interested in that. And um, I will definitely read through the uh, report that was submitted and the effort and, and definitely make sure, because if you're having that problem there, we're having that problem throughout the city, right? So if we can get it right with y'all, we can get it right in other neighborhoods. So thank you for your um, comments today. Thank you. Council Member Jackson. Yeah, Ms. Brown, I just want to say thank you for your coming and thank you for your continued advocacy for, you know, addressing the drainage issues within our district. Really appreciate you. Thank you. Next speaker. James Burford.
Hello. First of all, I wanted to thank the, uh, my fellow veterans from the veteran from the VFW if I see that they have departed. Also, I want to thank the council for allowing me to speak. My name is James Burford. I'm a resident of the Glen Manor Edition, located in the Northeast corridor of Houston. I'm also a disabled veteran. I come today to speak about the historical neglect of my, of my community. I've lived there since 1974, as I said, and I've faced numerous floods. I've faced uh, sewage in my toilet. Uh, I've uh, endured uh, health issues as I'm a disabled veteran, currently being treated by the Department of Veterans Affairs. And this has been a long going occurrence for me. Uh, I wanted to talk about the worst first and my impression of the worst first. I think that the way the city applies it is kind of backwards. I've noticed that uh, a couple of times I've had appointments at the Department of Veterans Affairs. And uh, I go down there and meet her, and uh, our meeting's blocked off because they're doing a major project on Breeze Bayou. Now, in my neighborhood, there's a project that's going on on Little York. It's nowhere the size of that that's happening at Breeze Bayou. So, to me, it looks like the city is using worse in monetary. In other words, if a, a neighborhood is affluent and they sustain, sustain extensive damage, then they get the money. They get repaired, they get recovery. And that's not happening in my community. And that's why I'm here speaking today. As you know, this is a long time problem with the city of Houston. So we have to look, to me, we have to look deeper. In other words, Houston has grown. I've been here over 50 years. The city has changed meticulously. And maybe, just maybe, it's time that we start thinking about another form of government, a city government. And there's no reflection on the mayor itself. It's just that the city has outgrown, and now it's time for a change. I think that once the citizen is able to input and there's true transparency and the citizens are involved, I think that a lot of our problems can be corrected. Some, no, but most of them, yes. There's no need for a community to be constantly flooding over and over and over again. Uh, the Your time has expired. If you want to wrap up your last comments, I'll give you a little bit of time to well, do No, I was just going to say that, you know, uh, times have changed, and now I think that it's time that our government change. Thank you and very thank much. thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker. Mal Berth Moses. How y'all doing? Uh, my name is Malbert Moses. Uh, I'm not going to take up too much of y'all time because uh, my colleagues have already gave y'all our speaking points and exactly what we were looking for. But I just want to reflect on some history because I live in the Glen Manor Place edition. And I've been out there for over 50 years. And when we first moved in that area, it was predominantly all white. And they used to come out on a regular basis, and we have ditches, and they used to come out on a regular basis and clean out the ditches and make sure all the heavy trash was picked up on a regular basis. But as the neighborhood started turning more and more colored and uh, biracial, the services started lacking a whole lot. And, I, you know, I always had this question in my mind, why? Now that we are in this stage and this far in, in history, now all of a sudden we're dealing with a lot of flooding issues. I have seen people that have died 
behind these floods. I've seen people that became that's become homeless behind these floods and still homeless. I've seen people that's still waiting on their houses to be repaired due to hurricanes and flooding. With no, you know, no no remorse and no they, they haven't got any type of help from anyone except for groups such as ours. And my question is, what's what's the problem? Why are we being overlooked? I just want to know why, why why are we being overlooked? Because we pay our taxes like everybody else, so we should get the same service as everybody else. So, I mean, now my question is, what's the holdup? What seems to be the problem? Why can't we get this service? That's all I need to say to you. I mean, just for food to thought, think about that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker. Felix Kapoor. Hello, council um, people. Thank you so much for allowing us the time to speak. Uh, I really want, I want to address one answer. Well, there was one council person that said, hey, what is the recommendation as far as like the different ways to choose um, projects? So I want to address that. But before addressing that, I definitely want to say that Northeast Houston, unless you have family there or unless you live there, you're not going there. So from the city of Houston's perspective, especially working in disaster recovery for years and being through multiple 100 year, 500 year, 1000 year storms, the city has zero attention over there. And it's really sad. And the next disaster is around the corner. And I'm wondering what everyone in this room is going to do. Is the response from the city just going to rely on small nonprofits and big nonprofits? to go and randomly select houses to just get disaster funds selected there. The Greater Houston Community Fund is a great first step, but that can't be the only step. There's some change that needs to be done. Hurricane season's coming, the next disaster is coming. Every single decade, there's multiple storms that hit this region and there's still no response. And it's, everyone always looks at me the same whenever I say that. So I, I would love for this council to band together to come up with a plan to respond because this not only affects Miss 72 year old Doris and Mal and Mr. Burford, but this also affects the affordable housing in this city. So I, I wanted to address that beforehand and I really wanna, I know you guys have a very hard job and I really want y'all to come together for a very sustainable solution to when this next storm hits, because it's going to come and we're going to be there. And I'm wondering if y'all are going to be there too. The next thing is they, there was a council person that was asking like, how should we select projects? We have three main recommendations from the demands that we have here. The first one at the box on the first page says, increase investment in drainage in BIPOC communities. And I loved her response of like, if it's happening in Northeast Houston, it's happening in other spaces as well. That's very, very true. Um, the first bullet point under, under number one of the demands on the first page that says uh, A, it says use the flood benefit index to measure current level of protection and investment. Um, letter B says move spending to get every neighborhood to the same level of flood protection. You know, SWAT spending is given to each district, if I'm not mistaken, and each district gets an allotted amount. But in terms of like infrastructure spending on like roads, for example, there's a more aggregate system that calculates like the amount of roads your district has. And when we went to Public Works to meet with them, they said they can't change that. Your time has expired. Thank you. I want to give him some more of my time. Come. I would like to give him some more of my time. You can finish up your comment. Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, yeah, the, when the, the, so yeah, we, I, I would hope this council gets together and says, how can we allocate SWAT, more SWAT spending towards areas that flood more like District B? 
Um, also, uh, letter C under number one says, tenfold increase in SWAT spending and LD fun LDP funds in LMI areas specifically. Um, and then obviously the maintaining and repairing of ditches and drainage infrastructure is just something I have to put in there because that's something we definitely have to take care of. The second is the city has to figure out how to put more money into areas that it hasn't invested in and harmed for decades. It is possible this is a wealthy city an industry that has caused a lot of harm lives here and must be held financially accountable. It's a big move, but the city needs to think of making change at that scale. There's toxic sites, cancer cluster, and the biggest landfill in Northeast Houston, not just by chance. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Councilmember Jackson, are you? Yeah, you yeah. Want to and I just want to say thank you for your comments. And I just want to um, just reiterate that you know, I understand, I share your frustration, I'm the mayor do, we all do. Um, I was actually, um, Lakewood is one of the neighborhoods I grew up in, um, off of um, Oak Knoll Street. And so, you know, I always remember when um, Hurricane, what was it, uh, Alicia hit, you know, and I remember being without lights for months and, you know, just, it was a struggle for me and my family in the community. And so I take this very serious. Um, when I got in the office, I realized that there was no investment, little investment in that side of town to address um, the flooding issues. And that was one of my priorities, is to make sure that we address the flooding, that our neighborhoods shouldn't um, flood every time it rains. And so, um, but I do commend the mayor for moving forward with SWAT projects, because the SWAT gives us the opportunity to focus on the neighborhoods itself, the drainage issues within the neighborhoods. And so I'm looking forward to continuing to work with Public Works to get some of these SWAT projects that we have on the books. Um, um, moving forward, I mean, because it's needed and I'm with you. I mean, we're going to have another hurricane season coming up within the next few months. And so, and we're still waiting on a study that should have been conducted years, decades ago. And so, um, just know that you have an advocate in here to, you know, for our neighborhood. Okay. Thank Thanks. you, Councilwoman. All right. Next speaker. Judy Harden. Ms. Harden, if you're on Can the you line. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? We can okay. hear you, Ms. Harden. Okay, thank you for allowing me to Okay, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Um, I'm trying to make this real quick. Since 2015, we were trying to get a speed cushion placed here in Inwood Pines on um, McKinney Lane. Fast forward, we were working with District A, uh, Amy Peck's office, they were able to get the speed cushion placed in this area. Um, and last year, back on June 23rd, um, the traffic department, I guess, it, yeah, the traffic division uh, spoke with um, Ms. Peck's office about the speed cushion. They told them, and I received an email, I still have the emails, that the speed cushion will be placed midpoint between McKinley Lane and Pine Ridge here. Well, going forward, when we got the speed cushion, no one knew that the speed cushion was placed in our area at all because it was not placed where it was supposed to be. They put the speed cushion in the wrong place. It does not do anything to deter the traffic. We have an excessive amount of traffic. It does not do anything to deter the speeding. It does nothing. We didn't even know the speed cushion was here. I kept bu uh, bugging District A about the speed cushion. We didn't even know it was out. That that just just shows you how much is done for this area. So I met with Mr. Ahmed Ghali with the Public Works on the 16th of this month. He came out. He he even agreed with me about you know that wasn't their department that said that this because would be here on McKinley and Pine Ridge. But when we walked down, one thing that he stated to me, he asked me if they move the speed cushion, then where is the traffic going to go? I say, they'll probably go right here on Pine Ridge. He says, well, that's the problem, because then I'll have to hear from them. He does not want to hear the complaints from the people on Pine Ridge, but I guess he doesn't mind us complaining. We did a petition. We stated on that petition what, that we needed that speed cushion to cut down on that traffic. We get up to 200 cars, almost 200 vehicles coming down the street per day. I have videos of all of it. I showed some of those videos to Mr. Ahmed Ghali, and I asked him even if he wanted to this to take back to his office to see the excessive amount of traffic. We're getting 18 wheelers coming down this street, dump trucks, everything. 
And that's the reason why they had the street cushion on Draco, because the city has been out three times to repair that street. And now the same is happening here. All we want is for public works to move that street cushion to where they originally stated it would be to cut down on this traffic and the speeding. Council Member Peck. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Hardin, um, for speaking today. We will contact you to figure out about the placement of the speed cushion and work with Public Works to make sure that it gets done um, right. So, and I believe that we're um, not quite done with your neighborhood with the speed cushions either. So there's still room to make some changes. So we'll be in contact with you. Okay, thank you very much. Next speaker. Mary Edwards. Mary Edwards, Ms. Edwards, if you're on the line, you can push star six to unmute. Next speaker. Joe Cutrufo. Joe Cutrufo. I'm here on the line. Go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Joe Cutrufo, and I'm the executive director of Black Houston Nonprofit Advocacy Group, working to make Houston a city where, regardless of who they are, where they safely and easily get around by bike. I'm speaking today in strong support of the city's plan to redesign 11 streets. As the Kinder Houston area has shown us, a majority of Houstonians in the future where they're able to spend less time in their cars and more time walking and Projects like the 11th Street redesign, which takes a four lane undivided highway and transforms it into a multimodal urban thoroughfare are exactly how the city of Houston can deliver that future. This is squarely in line with the city's Vision Zero plan to eliminate traffic deaths by 2030. Four lane undivided streets like the 11th account for 26% of Houston's total. This redesign would eliminate points and make it safer and easier to cross on foot and provide safe access to 11th Street's many destinations for people who want to. This plan also falls squarely in line with the city's climate action plan, bringing us closer to achieving its stated goals of reducing vehicle miles traveled per capita and providing equitable and safe mobility choices. This plan is also good for business. Earlier this month, Bike Houston volunteers went door to door at 11th Street to gauge business owners' knowledge of and support. The majority said they support the plan. Why? Because they know that their customer base is largely local and that a street that is attractive for walking and biking means business. For those with limited. Imagine how much it's to stop in and are biking by at five to 10 miles per hour than it is when you're driving at 40 miles per hour, which is just about the average. If we were to listen to the AC, and back away from the plan to build a safe 11th Street, not only are we reneging on the Houston bike plan, climate action plan, and the Vision Zero plan, but we'd also embolden those who would stand in the way of redesigning Houston's up. Don't put our plans and engineers in that position. They've been forced to go above and beyond their already rigorous engagement process to repeatedly defend work and their values, even though they're simply carrying plans that are aligned with our city's priorities. When he adopted the Houston bike, Rick Turner asked his planners and engineers to give a safe and convenient alternative to driving. When he adopted the climate action plan, the mayor asked his planners and engineers to reduce greenhouse gases. When he adopted the Vision Zero Action Plan, the mayor asked his planners and engineers to eliminate. Please just let them do their jobs. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you for your comments. Next. Councilmember Cisneros. Yes, um, thank you. I, I wanted to say thank you, Joe, for, for um, calling in today. Um, th this is this project is primarily in District C, but there is a little portion of it that crosses into District H, and I just wanted to say that that constituents I've heard from that we've gotten broad support for that that part that goes into District A. Parents that have children that go to Hog Middle School are grateful and relieved to have a safe place to cross the street to get to school. So um, I'm, I'm supportive. Um, it's, it's, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I do know that when we 
the roads safer for bicycles, we make them safer for everybody, for all road users. And that's definitely a goal of Vision Zero. Thank you. Okay, Council Member thank Pollard. Thank you, Vice Mayor Pro Tem. And uh, thank you, Joe, for coming forward in your comments today. Um, I made some comments uh, regarding cyclists, pedestrians, and uh, motorists several months ago. And um, Bike Houston, I think, egregiously took those comments out of context and posted them to your social media pages. And I, I wanted to address you about that because when you come forward and your entity comes forward to advocate for uh, safe um, street construction for bike lanes, um, I commend you for that and I support you in those efforts. But it does not do any good to misconstrue comments or take comments out of context and then use that to try to spur uh, public outcry when it was uncalled for. And so I wanted to publicly state that. I am looking forward to um, taking a bike ride with Bike Houston and some other entities this weekend uh, to better understand the dynamics of cyclists and to learn more about um, how we can improve safety for cyclists, motorists, and pedestrians. Um, but if we're going to find ways in which to improve uh, and make our city safer, we have to do it together. And I hope that you all will continue to work with my office. And if there's anything that I've said or done that um, has either been misinterpreted or taken the wrong way, work with our office to um, get a clear understanding before using social media uh, as a platform uh, to do, I think, more harm than good. Thank you. Next speaker. Gary Lynn. Gary Lynn, you can push star six to unmute. Yeah, so, uh, uh, I wanted to, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to talk about a bedroom. I met from incident that, that, that happened to me last week. Um, I, 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 I was at the Museum of Natural Science. And, and, uh, and um, uh, Hello, can y'all hear me? Can y'all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, so I was at the museum and uh, I, I, I had gotten thirsty and uh, hungry. So I decided to go to the cafe with a friend of mine, which was right across the street. And, uh, and, uh, I called Pedro. I called Pedro to let them know that I was going directly across the street and with my friends that we could eat. So anyway, they decided to push my time back from 2.30 to 3.15. So they made me wait an extra 45 minutes. And on top of that, when the driver finally came to get me and my friend, they could not find the location and told me it didn't exist. And this is a problem, constant problem with. Pedro, they refused to upgrade their GPS system and, and make them find some of these new locations. And I have advocated for them to please upgrade their GPS system. And they refused to do it. It's all over money. And it's the same reason 
they refused to come pick me up in front of my door, which is less than a mile out of the service area. It's 0.9 miles, and I have to wait at Walmart for an hour and a half sometimes, and I've spoken about this before, but my main problem is they refuse to upgrade their GPS system since 2009, and it's all over. They want the extra money to drive the clients the extra mile. And I've been told this by several drivers that they have brought it up to Metro themselves, and they don't seem to care about it. And it's quite ridiculous. And something needs to be done with this CPS system from Harris County and the city of Houston and Metro. They all need to get together and figure out a plan on how they can upgrade the CPS system. So thank you if anybody would like to comment on that. Uh, Mr. Lynn, thank you for um, calling and expressing your concerns today. We do have a, a memo that states that the um, Metro has um, reached out to Harris County Rides to try to come up with a plan to make sure that your um, transportation needs are being met. Um, if you have some additional concerns, uh, we can get you in touch with uh, the government affairs manager at Metro, but we appreciate you sharing your concerns. We want to make sure that your transportation needs will be, be met. Thank you. Next speaker. Ta Wong. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Councilman uh, Pro Temp. My name is Tai Hong, and um, I'm here to reiter um, reiterate our concern about our community, our HOA, and Super Neighborhood 17. We're in the opposition of Briar Forest Loft, where the prop proposed location is one half miles of South Highway 6 and Briar Forest. Last week, February 15th, Ms. Reckenbecker, the de de developer, was here and stated that she successfully addressed our concerns with the Super Neighborhood. <laughs> board and the neighborhood surrounding the proposed Briar Forest lot. I'm here to rebuke her statement. To the best of our knowledge, the majority of the issues were still unresolved. Mr. Jeff Baker, the president of the Super Neighborhood 17, sent an email to all city members. Um, I think Mr. Rene, did you get a chance to pass this out? Yes, okay, so th that's the email hard copy that uh, I want to give to you guys to acknowledge that there's still um, concern and the issue needs to be addressed. I would like to uh, um, highlight a few concerns from Mr. Baker's email, as well as our concerns for the community. Number one is the safety issues. There are no sidewalk, no crosswalk along Highway 6 for kids to walk or to ride their bike to school or to, to, the, um, to the stores. The speed limit on Highway 6 is 45 miles an hour. As you know, you know people in Houston, we drive a little faster than our speed limit. Um, any given time, there are approximately 30,000 car plus cars driving through Highway 6. In fact, there were three fatal accidents close to the proposed site just within the last few months. The children's safety is of utmost importance to all of us. Number two, the traffic issues. According to the Briar Forest law proposal, there's only one point of ingress egress to Highway 6. Currently, there's no median left turn into the proposed site. Vehicles have to make a U-turn to enter the site. In, a, in addition, any congestion during the morning or the afternoon traffic hour would impede and delay emergency vehicle attempting to navigate through this area. So we do have drone footage for the traffic. Number three, the school issues. Currently, we are facing with the high over, over capacity of student enrolling in the surrounding area, the proposed development only in compound on top of the existing overcrowding issues. Number four is the, the drainage and the flooding issues. This issue needs to be resolved by the developer. Anytime we have flash floods warning, flash floods in Houston, we are flooding in the Houston area. So anyway, I just want to um, uh, let you guys know that's a major concern for us, and I just want to thank you for your time for uh, allowing me to speak today. 
Thank you, Mr. Hung. Um, are you aware that that item was referred back to the administration at the last council meeting? Yes. So, okay. Yes, just but I, want... I just want to um, reiterate some of our concerns. That's all. Okay. Thank you very Thank much you for, for coming today. Next speaker, Steve Williams. Steve Williams. Next speaker, Sandra Edwards. Hello, everybody. How y'all doing today? Doing well. I'm not going to even bore y'all. Y'all done heard everything I was going to say. I don't even have nothing else to say, but I do have some things I wanted to mention. The property tax thing. I heard somebody say it, don't know who, but they were saying, okay, I know I'm one of the people that's been flooded. We know we have flooding coming again. I'm a Harvey victim. I have mold in my house. I'm still living through the same thing I had from Harvey. No help has come. Not yet. And I'm still waiting. And like they say, more floods are coming and may have to endure that. But I want to speak on property taxes. Okay, I'm, in, I'm, I'm over off Liberty Road in the council cluster. Okay, we have contamination, okay, along with the flooding, along with everything else, diversity. We're going through it all. We have it all coming our way. And it's not fair to the community. Not going to bore you with that either. Y'all done heard all that too. But the property taxes, don't they go to a percentage of what y'all use for the drainage or whatever to pay for things? They can find all these other monies to do homeless shelters and bring all this up stuff to our community. Why can't they? Uh uh. Why can't they? Um, Your time has take expired. That? <laughs> I can't. I please get an extension. Miss Edwards, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Why can't they take some of that money and put it into the flooding and do something, you know, constructive? They find money for all this other stuff that's really not benefiting the community. Why can't they find money? And do that. Um, I want to say I don't want to sound arrogant, but they find money for everything else. Why they can't find money to do some some solution? Uh, help us and do can do. We want to hear some I can sometime, not no 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 no, or you can't do it, or you too late, or you missed the meeting, you got to go there. We tired of jumping through hoops with gasoline draws on. We want to get a little bit of transparency. We want a little bit of okay. We know y'all y'all know the problem. Everybody know the problem. It's all over the news, all over the nation. So can we get a little bit of okay? We gonna do this for that community because we know they're disadvantaged and we know they have been so. Can we Ms. get some Ms. of that Edwards. a little bit? That's all I'm saying. I don't want to bore y'all, though. No, 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 you definitely are boring us, but I will tell you that um, you've heard your council member make comments throughout the day today. Yes. She is definitely um, wanting to be engaged awesome. and working on those SWAT projects and advocating for more projects for your area. And the entire council will, is joining alongside her to try to get as many urban drainage problems as we can in the city of Houston. So thank you to everyone in your organization that came out today, provided the information. Your cries are not falling on deaf ears and we will continue to keep working towards making your neighborhood one you can all be proud of. Okay, thank you. And she's one of I was with a Saturday with the police out there, tough and park. So, okay. All right, thank you. Next speaker, James Calza. Good afternoon. My name is James Kieser. I'm here in opposition to the Briar Forest Lofts project. Um, in addition to the safety, school overcrowding, and drainage concerns that have already been mentioned. Uh, in terms of site suitability, the project developer for this project recently appeared before this council and represented uh, that the proposed site is appropriate for multifamily housing. This is a small three-acre three -acre parcel sandwiched between a large commercial auto salvage junkyard with large noisy semi-trailers entering and exiting at all times of day and night. And on the other side, a large commercial bulk gravel sand and mulch operation with large bulldozers and other earth moving equipment moving enormous piles of aggregate. Furthermore, the project fronts a very busy and congested Highway 6 with only a planned one planned point of egress and ingress without a stoplight, a median break, pedestrian sidewalks, crosswalks. Uh, we have letters being provided or being drafted from the Super Neighborhood 17, the Lakes of Parkway uh, uh, Homeowner Association and the MUD 355 opposing the project and expressing serious concerns. To the extent all such issues can't be resolved, we request that a more appropriate site be located for the proposed project. 
Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your comments. And I, I don't know if you heard earlier that the this item was referred back to the administration um, last council meeting. Yes, ma'am, I did hear that. I just don't know what that means. Uh, that means that, that this project will not be receiving a letter of resolution and support from the city of Houston. Um, and typically without that letter, the project will have a very hard time to move forward. All right, thank you very much. All right, take care. This completes the lift of speakers. We stand in recess until 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. <laughs>